Chapter 3 Special Needs My schooling, like everything else in my life it seemed, was an entanglement of contradictions. My primary school was not as mixed as my secondary school, where the ratio of children hailing from around the globe seemed to be at least half of the student body. But there were still a fair few black and brown children in every class, and the economic differences between the families in the school were vast. Like my house, my primary school sat in the nexus between Highgate, a leafy, very wealthy, overwhelmingly white London semi-suburb, and Archway, an area not quite as rough as nearby Tottenham, but still nonetheless an area of concentrated council estates packed with the children of Irish, Caribbean and Cypriot immigrants. My primary school was probably one of the better ones in the area, and so attracted slightly more of the Highgate crowd than the Archway lot but that seemed to only highlight how differently we were treated by some of the teachers. From my first year, I encountered what can only be described as bullying, not from other students, as one might expect, the odd racist insult and normal fights aside, but from some of my teachers. My very first teacher felt that I had too much to say for myself. He was annoyed that I was a know-it-all, apparently. He was so irritated by my self-confidence, my willingness to speak, to offer opinions and even to know the answers to questions asked, all traits that schools are apparently supposed to encourage, that he told me that I was not allowed to speak in class at all unless he pushed my magic button. My magic button was an invisible spot on my chest that he would poke, thus allowing me to speak. His poke was hard and painful enough that this device had its intended outcome. I stopped asking to speak or to answer questions in class at all. I was five years old. Yet it was only during my final year of infants that I really started to appreciate how much an adult, even a teacher, could find a child's intelligence a reason to be pissed off. I'd been on a trip to Jamaica during the summer holidays before returning to start the new school year. I had the same teacher that I had had at the tail end of the year before for some reason. Knowing how talkative I was and what I had just experienced, my mum asked my teacher if she would allow me to take story time that week and tell the rest of the class about everything I had seen in Jamaica. That way, I would get it out of my system and not get into trouble for talking in class. The teacher reluctantly agreed. Until I actually started to tell my stories, that is. During one of my tales, I told the class that Jamaica was thousands and thousands of miles away, and my teacher, clearly annoyed by having to give me this platform, interjected sarcastically with, and I wish you were still there. I was crushed by the comment and my story stopped that day. The second incident I remember occurred when my mother asked to bring some books from class home for the Christmas holidays, and my teacher refused because I had previously lost one behind the apparatus at play centre. My mum said she would pay for the book if it was not found, but still the teacher refused. I'm not quite sure whether my mum came back into the school another day when my teacher was not there, or if it was the same day. But somehow we were left alone in the classroom and my mum decided to steal a whole set of books so I could read over Christmas anyway. I pleaded with my mum. No, you can't do that, mum. You'll get me into trouble. But she said, don't worry, son. We'll bring them back after the holidays. So off we went with a whole set of the top level books available for my age group. Despite my teacher's insistence that she was reading with me regularly, my mum was convinced I was not being pushed hard enough to reach my potential and was determined to properly assess my reading level for herself. Over that holiday period, my mum made me read the whole set, and it became very clear that the books I was being given in class were well below my level. Then the tension finally reached ahead. I'm not sure precisely how it occurred, but at some point during the course of that year, I had ended up in a special needs group outside of regular schooling. These groups were for children with learning difficulties and those for whom English was a second language. It is both necessary and admirable that schools make such provisions for those in need of them. But how did I come to end up in such a group? I was born in England, and shamefully, to this day, the only language I speak is English. At home, I was already reading books for young adults by this age, so clearly neither learning difficulties nor linguistic challenges could explain my being there. I knew at the time that something was amiss about me being in the group, but... As they gave us hot chocolate and biscuits every session, I was in no rush to leave. In the group, we did work that was well below what I was intellectually accustomed to, and thus I started to fall behind, to become lazy, bored and even resent the lack of challenges now inherent in my day's schooling.
but I also got the chance to get away from my teacher. On some level, I also thought I had done something wrong and that the group was some form of punishment, so I don't think I quite communicated to my mother that I had been taken out of formal classes. Which brings us to the crux of the matter. If I genuinely had learning difficulties, my mother and stepfather would surely have been consulted beforehand or at least informed that I was to be placed into this group. But they were not. For reasons best known only to my teacher, she had decided to put me in this group without informing my parents. I'm not sure exactly how long I stayed there, perhaps a month or two. Then, by total chance, one of the staff from my Pan-African Saturday school happened to be visiting my normal school and noticed that I was in the special needs group. My Saturday school had already been telling my mum that something was up with my behaviour and attitude, and now they knew what it was. They immediately informed my mum about me being in a special needs group, and she was, of course, furious. Now that my mum had found out, she quizzed me about the group, and I revealed just how deeply the problems ran. I did not like this teacher at all. I thought she hated me. I offered my mum a litany of reasons for why I was actually glad to be out of her class. She had told me she wished I had stayed in Jamaica. She always overlooked me to answer questions in the class and even got annoyed by me being a know-it-all. Yep, that one again. She was generally horrible to me. She sent me out of class for little to no reason and had even hit me with a ruler and a book on separate occasions. My mum could not believe what she was hearing. That a teacher had hit me and I had not told her. She was livid with me and with the situation, but most of all with the teacher in question. Needless to say, the very next day, my mum marched up to the school and demanded a meeting with my teacher. I sat there uncomfortably, wanting the ground to swallow me as my mum quizzed her, demanding answers about why I had been placed into the group, why she sent me out so frequently, and why she shouted in my face. My mum then dropped the bombshell. And why did you hit my son, with a ruler on one occasion and with a book on the other? Or words to that effect. The teacher had already seemed uncomfortable, but now she lost her composure entirely. I admit to tapping him she said, but it's not because he is, she trailed off and stuttered, looking at me and then at my mum, trying to find the right word to describe me. I imagine she wanted to say coloured, but knew that was an outdated expression. She perhaps then mauled over calling me black, but looking at my white mother made that seem inaccurate. So she blurted out, it, it's not because he is brown. My mother had not mentioned race up to this point, but it had been the unspoken subtext hanging in the air and now the teacher of her own volition had made it central. The mix of relief at having finally spoken her mind, embarrassment, shame and indignation on the teacher's face has stayed with me until now. I can still see her sat back on her chair. I remember the exact classroom at the end of the corridor on the first floor next to the headmistress's office, the door that I had stood outside of so many times, the large scary windows that let in an unbearable amount of light on the odd days that it was sunny, and the tiny little chairs for the future adults. It was now clear to us all that whatever abuses I had to deal with from this woman were entirely a result of her discomfort at having to teach little brown children, particularly those with a little too much brains and a little too much to say for themselves. I was removed from the group and I re-entered formal schooling, but the rest of that year was fraught with difficulties and I started to hate school, resentful at having to obey someone that I knew did not like me simply because I was brown. I remember a supply teacher came in for a week, to my relief. When reading time came, I picked The Man with the Golden Gun by Ian Fleming, and she told me I could not possibly read that and gave me something more suitable. It may have just been honest disbelief that a seven-year-old could read such a book, but I took it to be disbelief that I could possibly read such a book. And so the incident has stayed with me. Real-life racism makes you paranoid. Even in children, it creates the dilemma of not knowing if someone is just being horrible in the normal way, as people so often are, or if you are being blacked off, as me and my friends call it. My mum became extra diligent in observing my relations with the teacher. She saw my enthusiasm and behaviour deteriorate, and stressed herself out trying to find possible solutions. She spoke to my Black Saturday school, and they confirmed that, despite their best efforts, I was still misbehaving and my grades were slipping. My mum toyed with changing my school. She even considered sending me to private school, knowing that I was probably bright enough to get a scholarship of some kind, but I was entirely against the idea. I was excited at the prospect of a more challenging education, but I complained to my mum that I would be surrounded by posh white kids. 
at private school, and therefore it was an absolute no-go. As hard as state education was proven, I'd take my chances with my multicultural inner city school over and above the cultural isolation of being the only poor child among rich kids and the only brown child among white ones. By seven, I had understood my social location already and was not willing to venture into spaces of such alienation. By the end of the year, my near depression over school life had become so acute that when it became time for us to enter a new school year, the first year of juniors, my mum preemptively had a row with my new teacher. Clearly stressed, she, in retrospect unfairly, scolded him. If you're not going to bother to fucking teach my son, just let me know now and I'll just pull him out of the bloody school altogether. To the teacher's credit, he was not put off by my mother's swearing, but actually rather impressed by her passion for her son's education. He sat her down and they had a proper talk about the problems I'd been having. A conversation that ended with my mum agreeing to volunteer to come into the class on selected days to help children with their reading so she could keep an eye on me and be of use to the school as well. The effects on me were dramatic. While I was not overjoyed at the prospect of having my mother in my class, what child would be, my new teacher took such an active role in trying to unpick some of the damage done to my self-esteem and my attitude to school that I could safely say he changed the entire course of my relationship with formal education. It helped that I admired him. He was a mountain of a man, an amateur bodybuilder with a passion for American football and a very smart bloke too. What young boy would not want to be like him? I had not yet fallen in love with normal football and so under his influence I gravitated towards American football, persuading my mum to get me a ball and my friends to play this most un-English of sports with me. As you can imagine, Young boys did not take that much persuading to throw themselves and each other to the ground. Knees and elbows were cut and grazed on the concrete more times than I care to remember during this year-long obsession. My reading and attitude started to improve and I even got used to my mum being in class. In fact, I was proud that she was helping other children with their reading skills and one of my best childhood friends swears to this day that it was my mum who taught her to read. My relationship with this teacher became so close that he even gave me several American football books, expensive hardbacks that could not have been easy to replace. I am pretty sure I cried at the end of the year when I had to leave his class, but he would go on to look out for me for the rest of my primary school years. This would even bring him into conflict with my future teachers, those who did not have my interests so close at heart. He was of Polish origin, but I think British born. And in retrospect, I do wonder if his own experience of being an immigrant or the child of immigrants may have helped him to better cope with the challenges that such a diverse classroom presents. I never got to ask him about his upbringing during my school years, and I have not seen him since, unfortunately. The next year of junior school was another major step backwards, with a teacher that I clashed with, someone my older sister had already experienced and had not got along with, to say the least. She made my sister cry once by shouting at her and insisting that she was lying about having forgotten her homework at the house. To this day, my sister swears that she had actually done the work. It's only now looking back that I realise how strange it actually is to shout in an eight-year-old's face and call them a liar. My relationship with this teacher is best exemplified by two incidents, the first of which I will recount here, the other I'll come back to later. It's fascinating how impressionable a child is and how one seemingly insignificant experience can shape your life profoundly. For example, I nearly drowned twice as a child and had to be saved by a vigilant adult both times. As a result of these bad experiences, it took me until I was 30 years old to actually become a decent swimmer. Something similar has occurred with drawing and handwriting. My handwriting is almost illegible and, spookily, it is almost identical to my father's and grandfather's writing and I draw like a below-average five-year-old. I love visual art, but, much like swimming, an early negative experience very much discouraged me from pursuing drawing throughout my childhood. In the run-up to Christmas, my new teacher, the one that followed our English-Polish bodybuilder, had tasked all the students with drawing festive things, and I chose to draw a snowman. I was already quite insecure about my drawing, well aware that the natural talent I had with numbers and words did not extend to art. However, with this snowman, I was determined to prove myself, and so I did. Or at least, I thought I did. I drew what, to my mind, was the best picture I had ever drawn. A round and believable snowman, complete with a Christmas hat and surrounded by falling snowflakes. 
Perhaps it was not all that good in comparison with the more artistic children, but I was immensely proud of the piece and I turned it into my teacher with great satisfaction. She never seemed to be satisfied with my work, but I was sure she would be this time. I was mistaken. She told me the drawing was rubbish, or words to that effect, then ripped it up and commanded that I redraw it. I was devastated, but this was only the start. This process of redrawing my unsatisfactory snowman continued for the next couple of days while the rest of the class had moved on to other pursuits. I was totally humiliated. Of course, I have no idea if the snowman incident had anything to do with race and class in a direct sense, and I'm sure there are plenty of horrible teachers at private boarding schools too. But as you will see in Chapter 5, this particular teacher was an odd kind of liberal and seemed to have a real issue with me and my friend from Indonesia in particular, and with my older sister before that. It may have just been she was in a bad mood that day, did not like children generally, or just did not like me. Perhaps she genuinely thought I was being lazy with the drawing. Who knows? I retell this story in this context, however, to reflect on how a relatively simple action from an adult, in this case the tearing of a drawing, can affect a child's self-esteem quite dramatically, though I am aware it hardly ranks highly on the list of cosmic injustices. If there is a silver lining, perhaps this and other experiences like it have given me a degree of humility, a knowledge that whatever talents I have are only relative. As a child, I could remember dates and facts with relative ease and I was very good at mathematics though I am crap at maths now, through lack of practice. I was an archetypal nerd in my tastes, often preferring to watch wildlife documentaries than cartoons, and I could be found at many a family party engaged in philosophical discussions with the adults over and above running around with other children. I wanted to be a scientist of some kind, and or an astronaut. When my school took us to the planetarium and the science museum, it blew my mind to think about how vast the universe was and how much humans had come to know about it through curiosity and hard work. I was being shown the very best of British achievements, Newtonian physics, the theory of evolution, the steam engine, yet being led away from my natural desire to pursue these interests by the outdated bigotry and class conditioning of some of my educators. I was being encouraged to admire men, and they were mostly men for obvious reasons, who had changed the course of history and expanded the scope of human knowledge and at the same time being told to know my place. I was being exposed to genius, but being rewarded for not trying to aspire to it myself. This gives us pause for thought about formal education as a whole and the dynamics contained within it, whether education should be a site of power, a place to reproduce the social, societal norms, or a place to be encouraged to question and thus attempt to transcend them and be an active participant in remaking them. Is state education designed to encourage more Darwins and Newtons or to create middle management civil servants and workers. What tensions are brought into being when a child's natural proclivity to question everything in their own unique way comes into contact with a one-size-fits-all mode of education? State schooling in Britain, both today and when I was a child, seems stuck in a Victorian-era paradigm, guided by notions of discipline, obedience and deference to one's betters, of becoming a good worker and getting a good job. The idea that we go to school to find our passions, our calling, to learn to be happy, to draw out that which is within, as the root meaning of the word educate commands, is almost entirely absent, let alone any sense that we plebs should contemplate participating in the governing of the country. We can become so enthralled with officialdom that it's easy to forget that curricula are not the result of some universal abstract truth, but rather the designs of actual human beings like you and me. Despite the fact that I got almost straight A's, at no point in my formal schooling was I ever taught to think in terms of class or race, even though those two concepts have obviously shaped the world and my reality so profoundly. Though, in full fairness, I did not take sociology as a GCSE option. I left school without knowing what capitalism was, much less a mortgage, interest rates, central banking, fiat currency or quantitative easing. The word imperialism had never been used in the classroom, much less class struggle. What history I did learn can be seen as little more than aristocratic nationalist propaganda. Henry VIII and his marital dramas, how Britain and America defeated the Nazis, minus the Commonwealth and with a very vague mention of the Soviet contribution, how Britain had basically invented democracy and all that was good and wonderful. No one in my classes was given any understanding at all of why their classroom contained people whose parents hailed from all over the world. 
When the British Empire did come up, it was as this plucky, railway-building and sugar-exporting exercise devoid of any human victims. The fact that Britain has almost constantly been at war for the last century, even during the entire post-war era, was of course not mentioned even once. I understand that managing a national curriculum is no mean feat, but I am not sure that children being taught that their state is essentially benevolent, if a little rough around the edges, is the best way to breed adults who actually respect the limited freedoms their ancestors have attained. Thus it can be said that, even though I left school with almost straight A's, I had learned very little critical thinking in formal schooling. What remnants of disobedience I had left were learned outside of school or taught by the few renegade teachers that encouraged us to go beyond the curriculum. I am aware that it's cliché to look to the Nordic countries as ideal models and I'm sure their systems have their own deficiencies, but my experiences teaching in Scandinavia still shock me. I saw children waltz into class to loud house music blaring from the school speakers. I went into classrooms where no one called their teachers miss or sir and yet this lack of formality does not seem to have affected the quality of their educational outcomes. In just one example, in Copenhagen, I worked with a school group in a rough suburb, what we call a housing estate, where many of the kids were migrants from the Afghanistan and Iraq wars and other areas of conflict. To my complete shock, within five years of being in Denmark, all these children, a mix of refugees, asylum seekers and immigrants, had learned to speak Danish fluently and English to a standard that the poems they created compared favourably with any written by an average group of British 16-year-olds. Whilst it's always dangerous to extrapolate from an isolated experience, this did send me into a philosophical examination of British educational attitudes and practices, and I concluded that our schools do indeed, for the most part, kill creativity. As writer and internationally renowned educator Ken Robinson asserts, and I would argue that they do this by design. This led me to do some more research and stumble across the perplexing case of Finland, where students have no uniforms, are not banded into sets by ability, are not regularly tested or ranked, and yet are as high achieving as any in the world. And the gap between their strongest and weakest pupils is the smallest. My friend, the classical composer and entrepreneur I mentioned in the previous chapter, had a similar know-it-all experience in school, except all subtleties were suspended. He comes from a very formal and strictly religious Caribbean family, so when his mother was called into his primary school one day, it was taken very seriously at home. The teacher went on to tell his mother that her son was too smart. He knew all the answers and that he was not giving the white kids a chance. If she could just get him to be quiet, that would be wonderful. His mum is a fairly reserved person, but even she could hardly contain her indignation at something so ridiculous. But is it so ridiculous? Well, on the one hand, it's totally absurd for a teacher to feel this was an issue worth calling a parent into school for. On the other hand, I actually understand where the teacher is coming from and can usually empathise if given the opportunity to have an open adult conversation about things. British identity, despite all of the liberal rhetoric to the contrary, is obviously seen as synonymous with whiteness. Modern British identity grew with and was shaped by the fundamentally and undeniably racist British Empire. The domination of subject races is one part of that identity and for many teachers, in this case a woman born in the 1930s, it is entirely understandable, though still unacceptable, that within that frame of reference she would feel like a traitor to her race, to her culture and to her nation if she was to encourage colonial migrants, members of the subject races, to reach their full potential for excellence. To blame individual teachers or write this phenomenon off as just a few bad apples is not only to completely ignore decades of studies, but also to refuse to confront one of the key contradictions of British modernity. When large numbers of British-born black children started to attend British schools in the 1960s, the establishment was presented with a serious problem. How to educate, or under-educate, a group of people it had never intended to have full citizenship rights and did not really see as British. This problem must also be placed within the context of an already heavily class-stratified society and the history of education more broadly. During the 1960s, remnants of the eugenics-inspired assumptions about students' natural abilities were still all the rage. Schools for the mentally subnormal had simply been rebranded with the slightly more palatable title of 
schools for the educationally subnormal, ESN. These were schools outside of the official system where apparently difficult students, those with special needs or those with learning difficulties, were dumped. Unsurprisingly, black children were to be found massively overrepresented in these ESN schools in relation to the percentage they made up of the population as a whole. As a response to this reality, Grenadian scholar Bernard Cord set about publishing the now legendary How the West Indian Child is Made Educationally Subnormal in the British School System to Expose the Scandal of Systemic Discrimination in British Schools. The pamphlet was published by a small independent black publishing company and sold all 10,000 copies of its initial run and actually received generally favourable press at the time of publication in 1971. The reaction of the establishment was, of course, to deny the truths set out by Cord before eventually admitting he was in fact correct, but more shockingly to tap his phone and to have the police threaten his nephew. Such is the weaponized history of black education in Britain. The response of the British Caribbean community and progressive teaching staff was to attempt to try and tackle what they knew was an endemically and unfairly racist system. In every major Caribbean community, Black supplementary schools were set up, like the one I went to during my childhood. The first of these supplementary schools had already been set up three years before the publication of Cord's pamphlet by Professor Gus John, and Cord estimates that as many as 150 of them existed at the peak of the movement. Parent-teacher conferences and initiatives were launched, and scholars and black professionals lent their voices to a mass campaign to ensure that black children were given a fairer deal in Britain's school system. It is a very odd community indeed that simultaneously takes their meagre resources, remember most British Caribbeans are working class even now, and uses them to set up extra schools for their children, that manages to find volunteers willing to staff these schools every weekend for decades and is at the same time anti-education, as black people have so often been represented. How have things progressed since the 1970s and since I was at school? Are black children being treated fairly in British schools these days? Sadly and predictably, the answer is no. For example, in the year 2000, David Gilburn, David is white, by the way, for all those who need white references, and his colleague Heidi Sophia Misra were commissioned by Ofsted to examine the links between race, ethnicity and educational attainment as part of the legacy of the Stephen Lawrence inquiry. They examined the data from six local authorities' baseline assessments, which use a mix of written tests and teacher assessment to measure pupils' intelligence when they enter the school system, aged five. They found several unsurprising things that fly in the face of all the eugenics-based bullshit. Most notably, there was significant variation in the levels of attainment among the same ethnic groups in different parts of the country. There was at least one local education authority, LEA, where each of the major ethnic groups was the most likely to achieve five or more GCSE passes. In one particular LEA, Black children had the highest assessment scores of all ethnic groups when they entered the school aged five. In all six LEAs, the educational attainment of black students fell relative to the LEA average as they moved through the school system. In the largest LEA in their sample, one of the largest in the country, black students entered the school 20 points above the national average as the highest performing ethnic group, and in that very same LEA, they left the school as the lowest performing of all groups. 21 points below the national average. This report was widely cited in the left-wing media at the time, and you would perhaps think that showing such an obviously racialized pattern of educational disenfranchisement across all six LEAs would have caused a sea change in policy for the better, if indeed the intention was to remedy said institutional racism. Such change did not happen, and national policy changed instead to assess children entering school using the foundation stage profile or FSP method, a method that is entirely down to the individual teacher's judgment, that is to say, non-empirical. Unsurprisingly, the outcome of FSP, teacher-assessed tests, has been to conclude that white children are actually the smartest of all ethnic groups, despite the fact that Indian students have been dramatically outperforming them on average for many years. Why the state would make a form of non-empirical assessment compulsory in Britain's schools when it so obviously leaves room for whim and even unintended bias, one can only ponder. We can be sure that if the FSP assessment 
had dramatically changed the picture to the detriment of white students, they would have been changed by now. No special treatment is needed or being asked for, just a fair test that removes the margin for human error or misperception to influence the results. That is, if we must test five-year-olds at all. We know for certain that this trend of underestimating black children's intelligence continues right throughout schooling, which tallies with my experience and makes sense of the LEA data quoted above, where black children fall further behind the longer they stay in school. It is not complex. If a fair portion of your teachers, or even just a couple of them, constantly assume that you are way less clever than you actually are, simply because you are black and treat you accordingly, you are going to resent them and it will naturally affect your self-esteem and grades. In the final year of primary school in England and Wales, all pupils must take external examinations, which are blind marked by someone who does not know the child, thus eliminating any potential for racial bias. At the same time, teachers also assess the children in their class. According to a national study by Bristol University, between 2001-2002 and 2004-2005, teacher assessments of black Caribbean students were 5.6 points below their blind SATs results. This figure was 6.4 points for black African students, almost double that of the difference between teacher assessments and SATs for white students, which stood at 3.3 points. The study proved beyond any doubt that British teachers assess black pupils' academic ability as being far lower than their actual academic ability and underestimate their intelligence twice as much as they do for white children. Intriguingly, teachers underestimate black British students of African origin by an even greater degree than those whose great-grandparents came from the Caribbean, despite the fact that British African students have generally performed better academically. It is only with the blind marking of the key stage 2 SATs, in which an external marker does not know the child they are assessing, that we can see the huge discrepancy between teacher assessments and blind test results. The same study also concluded that Indian and Chinese students tended to be over-assessed by their teachers in comparison to their actual academic performance, again confirming the widespread stereotype that they are all super smart, and white students from poorer areas tended to be more underestimated than white students for more expensive postcodes. In short, the study confirmed that teachers are human beings and that they project their biases and those of our society onto children. The DfE is as aware of these studies and this data as I am, or at least we would hope so, and technically they have a legal duty to eliminate racial bias from within Britain's education system. But as you will see in a later chapter, it is increasingly unlikely that they are going to do so without serious parental, community and teacher pressure. When understood in its historical context then, my being siphoned off into a special needs group starts to make much more sense. What's fascinating is that the British state, apparently committed to a quality education for all, has rarely and barely supported these massive community-led efforts to make sure black Brits attain a quality education. And in the decades since the initial sympathy to Cord's work and the issues it raised, the British media has in fact been happy to feed the image of young black people as little more than thugs, muggers and drug dealers with little to offer British society. Nonetheless, my generation of British Caribbeans experience schooling quite differently from our parents in a number of ways. Firstly, I don't think it an overly harsh generalisation to say that our colonially educated grandparents generally had more faith in the British authorities than our parents came to have. And this often led them to refuse to hear the legitimate complaints of their own children against authority. Tales of being unjustly beaten, corporal punishment in school was not made illegal until 1986, or otherwise punished by teachers and then returning home to complain to parents who would then beat you again, often far worse than the teachers had, it must be admitted, and insist that you must have done something wrong for them beat you and if in our area must feel, are typical of our parents' age group. Our British-born parents, therefore, well understood the racialized challenges their children would inevitably face in school, and thus, while their strategies to combat such things were not always perfect, they certainly were far less likely to side with the authorities against their own children. My father's and uncle's experiences at school were so horrendous that they viewed school as a cultural and intellectual war zone where the victory in battle was won by every black student that emerged with A's from a fundamentally racist, classist institution. So when, in my last year of primary school, I complained to my dad about another teacher psychologically bullying me in vindictive ways that only an acute observer would see, he did not respond as his parents would have done, by beating me and telling me to just listen to your teachers. Instead, 
he came up to my school from West Sussex and met with the headmistress. When the headmistress tried to dismiss his claims that the teacher was patronising me and generally being intimidating and bullying, my father, six foot two and fifteen stone, got up and stood over the seated headmistress. Speaking in his softest, most patronising voice, he said, Now look, I'm speaking softly and being nice, aren't I? Yet we both know you're intimidated, don't we? The headmistress told my dad that he had made his point and that she would speak to the teacher in question, which to her credit, she did. The teacher's response was a characteristic mix of sarcasm, total dismissal and feigned concern. She declared to the whole class that we were having an official Be Nice to Kingsley Day or BNTK Day. Yes, she did abbreviate it and even wrote it on the board in big capital letters. And that Kingsley would today be able to do and say anything he wanted without anyone speaking back in response. Of course, I understood what was happening and tried to stay silent that day, but she directed every question at me, insisting to the class that Kingsley had to be given the chance to answer first, as it was BNTK Day after all. I was ten years old. Had my parents told me that my negative experiences in school were a result of my own behaviour entirely, or had they not had the intellectual equipment to adequately challenge my mistreatment, like so many of their class and generation, I would likely have dropped out of school entirely. But luckily, they took an active interest in my schooling and had no problem coming to my defence against the system. My mum understood that children in general, and rich white children in particular, would be given the benefit of the doubt and that I would not. My dad and all of my uncles knew how threatened many in British society, even some liberal white women, felt by educated black children especially boys, and how hard they would work against my educational attainments, even if sometimes only subconsciously. Were it not for their understanding and support, and that of a few radical teachers, of all ethnicities, ironically, my intellectual aptitude, my willingness to read and question beyond the syllabus, may well have led me away from formal education entirely. Even as an adult, the shock some people still have at a smart black guy often provides me and my friends with priceless moments of comedy. Of course, I can tell the difference between someone genuinely complimenting my public speaking as they would any other speaker, and someone shocked that I speak so well for a cockney sounding darky. When I'm on a television program or a panel and the opposing person feels the need to patronisingly let me know that you actually made quite a good point, as if they are still processing the fact of it, one wonders whether race, accent, a class indicator, and dress code are all factors. It's hard to imagine them feeling the need to let an RP-speaking white Cambridge professor of my age know that he actually makes a good point, though perhaps some of these types are just that patronising. I'm sure many Northerners or Scousers have felt similarly patronised based on the stigmas attached to their accents, and my friend, who is a professional writer of Cypriot origin, whose father came up in Hackney, often talks about his early jobs working in various companies where his colleagues and bosses could not believe that you read Herman Hess. You. So, as always, there is much crossover between assumptions based on class indicators and race, race itself being one of the biggest and most obvious class indicators. It's also interesting how class norms can be a disability going into certain spaces, like televised debates. Because the truth is that working class people often don't have time for all that poncy doublespeak. And when someone is openly patronising and rude, our natural response is to tell them to fuck off. Or, if they are rude enough, to offer them a trip outside for a good old dust up. I cannot tell you how many times I've had to fight that urge. My composer friend and I often joke about the look of shock on some white people's faces when they're introduced to him as the composer of the music they just heard the orchestra play and when they try to politely hide their shock and or resist the urge to ask who helped him do it. No, I am not joking. The question, who helped you do it, has been asked of him many times. What's most funny is that my composer friend confuses and confounds the racial stereotypes of everybody. He is very traditionally well-spoken, even posh, and a classical composer. He is also one of the best-dressed men going and manages to pull off out-there fashions that most brothers would never try, such as tweed suits and ponchos. Black people sometimes hear the accent, see the clothes and assume he wants to be white. 
because they have sadly internalized the idea that there are only certain types of authentic ways to be black. I've seen their shock too when they realize how black his politics are, despite the suits, the piano and the RP. He actually knows far more about African history and culture than the vast majority of dashiki-wearing Afrocentrists. White people often make the same mistake and say the strangest of things to him, again, thinking that he is not one of those black people, you know, the ones that actually respect and love themselves. The threat posed to some people's entire sense of identity by an exhibition of human excellence inside a black body is an amount of fear, sideways admiration and contempt for another group of humans that I can't even imagine being constantly burdened by. These seemingly odd responses to black excellence did not pop out of a vacuum, but rather stem from centuries of anti-black marketing in European literature, thought, philosophy and historiography. Take the historians that claim that Africans, unlike the rest of humanity, had no history. And thus, when they found evidence of this supposedly absent history from pre-colonial Africa, from the ruins of Great Zimbabwe, to the manuscripts of Timbuktu, to the sublime metal art of Ile Ife and Benin, set about trying to look for a non-African source for these works. In some cases, scholars were more willing to entertain the idea that aliens were responsible for African history than Africans. This intellectual trend was pioneered by those who took the conditions of enslaved people, that is, people physically prevented from attaining an education, and decided that their perceptions of the intellectual aptitude of slaves represented the permanent and genetically predetermined state of all black people. To smarter and more humane European thinkers, even during the 19th century, it was obvious that an enslaved person had very good and obvious motivations for hiding and or playing down their intelligence, and that any technological gaps between Europe and West Africa were no more likely to be due to skin colour than the technological gaps that existed for centuries between the olive-skinned Romans and the white people to the north of them, or indeed between Song China and 10th century Britain. Euro-America's ability to dominate black people has not been read as one more chapter in a long history of human exploitation and domination, but rather as permanent racial superiority and inferiority. Thus, as late as the 1990s, top academics could argue that racialized differentials in IQ scores in the USA had absolutely nothing to do with the material history of that nation, but rather that black people were just genetically inferior. Of course, the obvious parallel argument that white people are genetically inferior to Southeast Asians, now that people from that region score higher on the Western eugenics-inspired IQ test, has certainly been far more muted. While I am not suggesting that people who are shocked at my friend being a classical composer or by my other homie who is a trauma surgeon would publicly admit or even honestly believe that black humans are genetically inferior, this is, nevertheless, the historical propaganda they are responding to and have been influenced by. Britain, it seems, is trapped by its own history and the conflict with its own liberal rhetoric. Are we really trying to encourage and normalise black academic excellence in the UK? Or would we prefer the extra cost of imprisonment and crime that comes further down the line after neglect, just so one can still feel superior? What are the long-term demographic and political consequences of creating a prosperous and thus potentially politically powerful black middle class? Let's just be honest. If we want to fix the racial and economic disparities in the criminal justice system, or at least reduce them, combat teenage gang violence, produce better educated children, and create a generally better society, then the work starts in the primary school, not in the prison. Chapter 4. Linford's Lunchbox The Negro is an example of animal man in all his savagery and lawlessness, and if we wish to understand him at all, we must put aside all our European attitudes. GMF Hegel Africans are the most degraded of human races, whose form approaches that of the beast and whose intelligence is nowhere great enough to arrive at regular government. Georges Cuvier One is no longer aware of the Negro, but only of a penis. The Negro is eclipsed. He is turned into a penis. He is a penis. Franz Fanon On the 1st of August, 1992, I sat down to watch the final of the men's 100-metre sprint at the Barcelona Olympics. I was just nine years old, 
but athletics and football had by now become a virtual religion for me, though I never quite inherited the obsession with cricket from the older generation of Caribbeans. The whole family fell silent as the men took their starting positions. We were all rooting for Linford Christie, the British champion and one of the foremost black British figures of a generation. Along with Ian Wright, Soul to Soul, Lenny Henry and Lennox Lewis, Linford was part of the strange phenomenon of black Brits winning an informal and unspoken access to a contingent Britishness through sports, culture and entertainment. Black excellence in sport and entertainment has been a particularly contradictory feature of Anglo-America. On the one hand, it echoes old stereotypes about natural rhythm, brawn over brains and natural animal athleticism. On the other hand, it creates a noticeable schizophrenia. How could black people remain second-class citizens when some of the greatest representatives of British or American excellence to the world were black? How could England fans keep throwing bananas at black football players now that half the national team was black? How could white America keep claiming the niggers were inferior post Jesse Jones, Jack Johnson and Muhammad Ali? The contradiction was glaring. This dichotomy and the way people handled it came to life for me in that first week of August 1992. Linford won the Olympic gold medal in the 100 metres that night, one of only two British athletes to do so since Harold Abrams in 1924. My house went wild. We were so happy for Linford, yet as we watched him drape himself in the Union Jack, we felt the discomfort, joy and confusion of black households up and down the country. Happy for Linford, but resentful of the flag that to us represented the National Front, colonialism, police brutality and the Babylon system. Many of our grandparents proudly saw themselves as British subjects and had no real issue with the flag. Indeed. Many thousands of them had fought under it. However, by the time of Linford's victory, we had become so disheartened by decades of institutional racism that most of us accepted we probably would never really be British in the way white people could be. Even the millions of white British people whose immigrant grandparents arrived at the exact same time as ours. Norman Tebbit's infamous 1990 cricket test in which black Britons were invited to pick a side when England played the West Indies, showed both how exclusive some people's concept of national belonging was and exposed the area of sport as a key site of national and racial anxieties, loyalties and frictions. As Linford ran around the track, close to tears, draped in the Union Jack, with thousands of adoring fans cheering and millions watching at home, I doubt he had any idea of how the tabloid press would convey his victory in the coming days. Watching at the time, I certainly had no idea. I walked into the newsagents in the days after Linford's win and, oddly for a nine-year-old, was browsing through one of the tabloids, maybe taking a sneaky peek at page three, to be honest, when I stumbled upon the strangest cartoon. There had been a hosepipe ban that summer, and this cartoon featured a caricature of Linford Christie with a huge bulge in his trousers. The hosepipe inspector was pointing to the bulge and informing Linford that there is a hosepipe ban, you know, or words to that effect. I knew this was very strange and that there was something significant in this story being run just after the highlight of Linford's career, but of course, I get the significance a little better now. In the days and weeks after Linford's historic victory, the press was not focused on his contribution to British sport, but instead full of stories about Linford's lunchbox, a less than subtle euphemism for his apparently huge penis. Presumably, Linford had the same exact penis for his entire career and did not get a transplant on the night of the 31st of July 1992. So why had the press chosen this moment, the moment of the greatest glory of an athlete's career, to objectify Linford in such a way? The obsession with Linford's lunchbox was said to have been begun by The Sun, who on the 6th of August 1992 ran a feature entitled 10 Ways to Pack Your Lunchbox Like Linford. In this feature, they got a black model to pack his shorts full of goodies to achieve that look. Other newspapers, including some of the broadsheets, ran their own stories about Linford's lunchbox, and it became a sort of cultural cliché. If you ask any person of my age or older about Linford's lunchbox, they are likely to know what you mean and to remember that particular race at the Barcelona Olympics. Prior to that night, 
I'm not sure much thought had been given to Linford's penis in particular, as all of the male athletes wore similar lycra shorts. The question is, would Linford's penis have ever become a story if he had not won? Linford made his feelings about the distasteful nature and poor timing of the comments pretty clear, which only damaged his already rocky relationship with the British media. Linford's concerns were generally brushed off or dismissed as him being oversensitive, even by some black journalists like Tony Sewell at The Voice, who accused Linford of being a big girl's blouse and claimed that celeb guys like Linford made him ashamed to be a black man. Rather odd, to say the least. The lunchbox scandal reached its iconic peak when Linford appeared on ITV's Sport in Question with Jimmy Greaves, Chris Eubank, Ian St. John and a journalist from the Mail on Sunday called Patrick Collins. After a question from an audience member about the media treatment of him, Linford Christie again made it quite clear that he felt the media had treated him unfairly and overlooked his achievements in favour of an obsession with his lunchbox. This Sport in Question episode then descended into a row that will be, and has been, written about for decades because of what it said about race, sexuality, culture and British politics. Patrick Collins defended the press and accused Linford of seizing on some negative comments and making generalisations about the media, despite Linford pointing out that even the broadsheets had carried the lunchbox story in the wake of his Olympic gold. Jimmy Greaves told Linford that he should wear something more appropriate if he was so offended and let him know that he has never offended me with it, his penis, and I can tell you that a lot of women are fascinated by it. Unsurprisingly, Chris Eubank then took the side of Linford and entered into an argument with Jimmy Greaves, where Greaves revealingly told Eubank that he should not have entered the ring to the song Simply the Best, essentially that he should have been more humble and known his place. Why were these thoughts on the tip of his tongue? By the end of the dialogue, Linford wound up crying and the mood entirely changed once Greaves realised Linford was actually seriously offended. It is an iconic moment in British television, and I felt an enormous sympathy for Linford and actually feel that his tears, far from making him a big girl's blouse, as Tony Sewell said, showed a fragile and human side of black masculinity that is rarely if ever seen on British television. It's fairly clear to all that Linford could snap Jimmy Greaves' neck in two if he chose to, but instead of raging and becoming the angry black man, though there is certainly a place for that, Linford cried, a perfectly valid response to the rage that a person might feel when their spectacular achievements have been overlooked in favour of their genitalia. Stuart Pearce, Paul Gascoigne and many other British footballers have publicly cried at iconic moments in their careers and received sympathy and support. So it's rather a shame that a writer at Britain's main black newspaper took this moment as a chance to have a dig at Linford for not being man enough, rather than to examine the dynamics that were really at play. Linford did complicate the picture, and invite justifiable accusations of hypocrisy by later making adverts that overtly played on his lunchbox. One for Kleenex featured a topless Linford with the slogan, I've got a small packet. He also became the face of underwear campaigns, which again invited a certain criticism. However, the issue here for me is not really about the personal decisions of an individual black athlete, but rather how this story fits into the larger narratives around black athleticism. In one of his brilliant essays, looking at black British athletes, Ben Carrington contrasts the rocky relationship between the British media and Linford Christie to the almost unconditional love offered to Frank Bruno by that very same press in the exact same period of history. Bruno and Linford are in many ways symbolic of the differing cultural attitudes, desires and understandings of blackness between Britain's black population and the white mainstream. For most black people old enough to remember, Bruno has always been a problematic character and certainly not an icon or hero, often seen as an ignorant stereotype that makes us look bad. This is, of course, totally unfair to Frank, as he should not have to be a representative of his race. That said, while Mr Bruno seemed to mean no harm, his unapologetic royalism, fat right politics and even his refusal to respect the cultural boycott of South Africa at the height of the apartheid struggle make him a more problematic proposition than the simple Frank persona might suggest. Despite enormous pressure from anti-apartheid groups, Bruno fought the South African Jerry Coetzee in 1986 and justified this with a fat right politics of every man for himself and I gotta feed my family. He even went as far as to say that his promoter Mickey Duff had told him that Coetzee was anti-apartheid and that he had dozens of black friends. 
For all these reasons, Bruno came to be seen by most black people I knew as white people's black guy, despite his achievements in the ring. Growing up, I remember hearing uncles and community members regularly diss Frank, and most would cheer for the black American over him. Unlike with Lennox Lewis or Nigel Benn, both of whom were more loved. For the most part, the deference, the solely individualistic concerns and the failure to see the way he was being used in Thatcherite Britain made Frank Bruno at best an ambiguous figure to Black Britain and at worst a very disliked one. Frank was obviously well aware of this and it eventually took its toll on him. In 1995, Frank Bruno fought Oliver McCall for the WBC Heavyweight Championship of the World. I tuned in, as always. Boxing was very much part of that aforementioned sporting religion. The fight was titled The Empire Strikes Back, with copious use of the Union Jack on the flyers and posters and in the press. Bruno's earlier fight with Lennox Lewis had been marketed as the Battle of Britain, so the nationalist imperial themes were not new. After 12 hard-fought rounds, Bruno won on points to become just one of nine Britons to enter the elite category of world heavyweight champion, seven of whom are black. The post-fight interview contrasts very interestingly with Linford's television breakdown. Sat at ringside, still sweating with tears in his eyes, Frank Bruno repeatedly asserted to the interviewer that I'm not an Uncle Tom, I'm not an Uncle Tom, perhaps seven or eight times across the interview, even though the questions he was asked bore no relevance to that issue at all. Here we have two black athletes at the height of their careers breaking down on television for reasons entirely to do with the dynamics of racism, but with very little mainstream public analysis in the aftermath. In the pre-fight hype, McCall had indeed called Bruno and Uncle Tom, as had Lennox Lewis in the run-up to their fight. Bruno had claimed repeatedly to not see colour, a sentiment guaranteed to win applause from much of the white British public. He also claimed that racism was just a few ignorant people, and he may well have sincerely believed that. But watching the big man cry at ringside and repeat over and over again that he was not a sellout or an Uncle Tom, you really get a sense that Frank, despite himself, really did understand that something was majorly amiss and that there was a part of his identity or credibility with his community that was missing. Something that he felt he needed to vindicate right then and there at the most important moment of his career. You see, black adults I knew growing up did not hate Frank Bruno. They actually loved him. Perhaps felt a little sorry for him, and for that reason it pained them to see people that did not really respect Frank's humanity claim to love him while sneering behind his back. Had Frank ever asserted himself, problematised the obvious racism that existed in Britain at that time, or chosen to boycott fighting the South African in a basic recognition of black South African humanity, large portions of Frank's fans would certainly have turned on him. This we knew. So in a sense, we wanted to protect Frank from exactly the kind of desperate outrage and cry for help that he displayed in that post-fight interview. As Carrington points out, unlike Linford's lunchbox, Bruno's Uncle Tom breakdown went largely uncommented on by the mainstream media, perhaps because the British press at the time would not have had the political vocabulary and knowledge of history to even deal with the significance of the event. To deal with it would have meant many white journalists asking why their favourite son, a black heavyweight champion and presumably a multimillionaire, still felt somewhat like a failure because he did not have the love of his own people. Frank was admitting with this breakdown that the money and admiration of white Britain was not enough, that he knew in fact that it was not genuine and that he craved to be loved by black people in a way that other athletes and public figures had been. Tone-deaf British journalists who have kept themselves functionally ignorant of Britain's racial history simply could not grapple with all this. Fast forward to the 9th of August 2012. I sat down to watch the men's 200 metres final at the London Olympics. Usain Bolt had already won the 100 metres a few days earlier and it looked set to be another year of dominance for him and for Jamaica. Like all British Jamaicans and sprint fans everywhere, I was very excited. Then, something very strange happened. For who knows what reason, the BBC decided to play a weird eugenics film just before the final. The commentator, who was sat next to a trio of black track legends, Colin Jackson, Michael Johnson and Denise Lewis, introduced the film in the following way. As we build up to the 200 metres, and this is a subject that doesn't get raised very often because it just doesn't, but the fact is that not a single white athlete has contested the men's 100 metres final in the Olympics for 32 years. 
82 people have broken 10 seconds for 100 meters and 81 of them have been black. The only one who is white is Christophe Lemaitre of France, who is running tonight in the 200 meters final. In fact, only four white men have ever gone under 20 seconds for 200 meters. So it brings the whole issue of nature or nurture into very sharp focus. There are a number of obvious problems and lapses in basic logic within this statement. First, almost 40% of the men on earth are from India and China, not to mention the rest of the non-white but non-black world. Yet whoever wrote this script seems entirely unconcerned with their lack of presence in Olympic sprint finals. A very clear white nationalist statement is being made. The issue is that white men are not winning which should apparently be the norm, and to make matters worse, it is black men defeating them, as if there is a permanent competition between black and white athletes. The viewer and society are being told that if black people are beating white people at anything, there must be some kind of explanation. After that introduction, a short film played, beginning with a discussion of Darwin's On the Origin of Species, the Eugenics Movement, and Nazi Genocide. This was then linked to black athletic performance, as the voiceover informed us that all of the great sprinters could trace their ancestry to Africa, that is, to slaves. Then the voice asked, who was it that survived being put in shackles, packed into slave ships and taken across the ocean? Who was it that survived the life of forced labor on the cotton and sugar plantations? The fittest, only the fittest, could survive. The film stopped, and Colin Jackson was asked for his opinion. After Colin refuted the nonsense with a scientific study, which he had actually been a part of, that found that both black and white athletes have the fast twitch muscle that is apparently the key to sprinting, the commentator's response was, but are we at the point now where if you are a very talented athlete at 14, 15, 16 and you are white, you are almost institutionally programmed to think that you won't be able to compete at the highest levels in the sprint? This is a very revealing question from a white public figure. Because when black people assert that representation is important, that having role models you can relate to and who look like you is helpful, they are often accused of making excuses, playing the race card or wanting special treatment. Yet here, before the 200 meters final, was a public service broadcaster asserting that actually it does matter and that seeing black people win in a competition that no white people have ever been barred by law from entering or in any way discriminated from participating in could still discourage white teenagers from bothering to even try. Wow. Michael Johnson, who, sadly, also did a documentary investigating the possible link between slavery and sprinting, also refuted this suggestion, saying that culture, training and the national popularity of a given sport are all more important factors than some mystery gene, which is obvious enough, even to a non-scientist. The fact that the question is even asked, the fact that black excellence in a particular field needs explaining, tells its own story. I can't recall any documentaries trying to discover an organisational gene left over from fascism that explains why Germany and Italy have consistently been Europe's best performing football teams, Spain's brief spell as the best team in the world, with a generation of players born in the years immediately after Franco's death would seem to confirm my fascism meets football feces, right? Clearly, this would be a ridiculous investigation, or who knows, maybe I'm onto something. But the question would never be asked because German, Italian, and Spanish brilliance don't really need explaining, or at least not in such negative ways. When I was young, I vividly remember watching a BBC doc called Dreaming of Ajax, which investigated why one Dutch club, Ajax Amsterdam, was able to produce better football players than the whole of England. It was a fantastic documentary that looked with great admiration at the obviously superior coaching systems of Ajax, which became so visible in their homegrown players' performances. But it did not look for some mystery Dutch gene left over from some horrendous episode in European history. Nor did white dominance in tennis or golf, until Tiger and the Williams sisters anyway, need to be explained by their ancestors having so much practice whipping people for so long and ending up with strong shoulders and great technique as a result. To get to the root of just how ridiculous the slave sprint correlation is, let's look at some basic common sense facts. Before Usain Bolt's victory in Beijing in 2008, Jamaica had produced not one single male 100 meter gold medalist. Yet we are apparently being asked to believe some latent super slave gene suddenly manifested itself 
148 years after the abolition of slavery at the birth of one Usain St. Leo Bolt. Brazil has roughly 40 times as many black people as Jamaica and was the last country in the Western Hemisphere to abolish slavery. Yet, not a single Brazilian has won even so much as a bronze at the 100 metres. Brazil's sole individual sprinting medal was a bronze in the 200 metres in 1988 won by Robson da Silva. Frankie Fredericks from Namibia, so not a descendant of an Afro-American slave, has won four Olympic silvers in sprinting. So that is four more than all 80 million plus black Brazilians put together. What is one to do with such a lack of common sense? The inability of whoever commissioned that film to accept that the hard work, sacrifice and years of vomit-inducing training it took 81 black men to run 100 metres in under 10 seconds are hardly representative of the other hundreds of millions of black men is a little odd. To air such anti-intellectual nonsense right before one of the most watched sporting events in British television history is odder still. The idea that black athletes owe their achievements to the sideways gift of benevolent slave masters rather than to greater hard work, the cultural importance of sprinting in a given country, the quality of the coaching and better organisation and preparation is just fantastical. What's more, it's an even greater insult given that the real institutional legacies of slavery that can be so clearly seen in Jamaica and throughout the Americas are ignored or played down, while this nebulous link between slavery and sprinting is given primetime coverage. Cuba's phenomenal record of achievement in Olympic boxing, like Jamaica's recent one in sprinting, or New Zealand's in rugby union, or the USA's in basketball, might have something to do with these same institutional and cultural factors. Yet, for whoever commissioned this film, the rather easily traceable nature of Jamaica's athletic excellence, youth meets Field National Stadium, just cannot be. It's not possible that mere Jamaicans are, like the Dutch of Ajax, better prepared, more dedicated, disciplined and more organised than their competitors. It's not as if any of the other Caribbean islands, all of which also had plenty of slavery, have come close to replicating Jamaica's success in this area. Usain Bolt has won three times as many 100 metre gold medals as all of the other islands combined. Lastly, the vast majority of enslaved Africans were not taken to the continental United States and there is good evidence that the slave regimes of the Caribbean were far harsher. So if the survival of the fittest slave theory held true, the Caribbean nations would always be the leaders in this arena. Yet it is the United States that has traditionally dominated sprinting by quite some distance. Yet, as the commentator frankly admitted, for racist people who have convinced themselves of innate white superiority, consciously or unconsciously, watching black men dominate the two supreme sporting tests of masculine virility, the 100 metre final and heavyweight boxing, must feel quite disheartening. It's notable that East African domination of long distance running seems not to evoke similar insecurities, though it has also invoked its own plethora of explanations and stereotypes. My own relationship with sport is an interesting one. Being of Jamaican heritage, sprinting was always popular among my community and friends. Despite being primarily interested in football as a teenager, I ended up competing in the London Youth Games in the 100 metre sprint, where I defeated the seven fully black boys in the final and went on to compete in the All England Games. Of course, you could not help but notice how disproportionately represented black youngsters were at the Games. But I was knocked out of my competition in the semi-final and the only white boy in our entire competition came first. The truth is, we did find this weird. And on the way back on the coach, people made jokes about getting beat by a white boy. My mum being white didn't count in this conversation. It seems even we had internalised this idea about black people being naturally athletic rather than seeing what was obvious, that sports and entertainment are two of the only fields where black success has been clear and visible in post-Second World War Britain. And so it's hardly a surprise that young black men pine after the only two fields they see as open to them. When I go to schools here and ask young black boys what they want to be when they are older, footballer and rapper are the two most commonly repeated aspirations. I have asked the same question in schools in Zimbabwe, South Sudan and Ethiopia, and the answers were vastly different and much more varied.
Like the typical black youth from the ends, I played football at various levels, school, district and Sunday league. However, I went a little bit further than normal and eventually played for the youth team of West Ham United during the golden years when the club produced future England internationals Joe Cole, Michael Carrick, Rio Ferdinand, Glenn Johnson and Jermaine Defoe. Race was an ever-present theme in football, though it often went unacknowledged. Black players were expected to accept racial banter without having a chip on their shoulder about it. So when my coach asked us to go and get the wog box, the stereo, I was the only one who could not take a joke and got irritated. Maybe my white coaches had watched Spike Lee's legendary film Do the Right Thing and remembered Radio Rahim, but I doubt it very much. The sport versus academia struggle was a strong current in my teenage years and it always contained racial undertones. I was good at football and played for West Ham schoolboys, but I also went to the Royal Institution of Mathematics masterclasses. My Black Saturday school and my uncle offs were pushing me toward my first love, science. My uncle always told me I was smart enough to pursue a career in quantum physics from an age when I did not even know what quantum physics was. Years later, when I took up football, he was secretly disappointed and told my mum that he feared that football would ruin me. He, like many others in the black community, essentially viewed black sportsmen mostly as fools who did very little for their community and rarely, if ever, used their platforms to speak out about injustices once they personally had made it. With obvious notable exceptions. People like my Uncle Offs were far more impressed by black academics like Walter Rodney and C.L.R. James than they ever would be by a footballer. When I started secondary school, my mum said in passing to Mr. Mohammed, a famous black teacher at my secondary school, that I could not wait to join the football team. And his response was to say, I hope he is as keen on his studies. I now find myself saying the exact same thing to classes full of black boys who all want to be football players. I know Britain has spent quite some time convincing itself that black people in general and Caribbeans in particular are naturally great at sport and inimical to education. But all this shows is how little they actually know us. Quite aside from the tradition of community self-education that I was a beneficiary of, you could just venture into any Caribbean barbershop or takeaway, the only two businesses we run in the hood, and see who is on the wall. Who is it that we choose to venerate? Is it drug dealers? Never. Is it athletes? Sometimes, but rarely. More often than not, the faces on the wall will be Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, Bob Marley, Muhammad Ali, and in the case of my barber shop in Harlesden, a poster of black scientists and inventors. So why have so many white people and publications been upset by black sport and achievement? I mean, I can't imagine watching Russian or Chinese dominance in gymnastics and thinking, I'm never going to try that because I am not Russian or Chinese, much less feeling ethnically inadequate. I can't imagine watching Lord of the Rings and thinking, oh, white people being excellent again. What a bummer. This brings us to one of the least spoken about aspects of Western racial mythologies over the past few centuries. The insanity it inflicts on many of its intended beneficiaries. An identity predicated on supremacy is not healthy or stable. An identity that says, I am because you are not, is what Hegel was talking about when he wrote his master-slave dialectic, even if he did not realise this himself. The long and short of it is that the master makes himself a slave to his slave by needing that domination to define him. White supremacists, as much as they don't want to admit it, make themselves slaves to black excellence when they allow its existence to unbalance their entire sense of self. This racialized fragility is what caused the racist mob attacks in Britain in 1919 and 1958, the firebombings of the 1980s and the now famous case of Stephen Lawrence. Humans kill for a whole host of strange reasons, yet we rarely think about how strange it is for the color of another person's skin to provoke a strong enough reaction to want to murder them. We talk about white privilege, but we rarely talk about the white burden. The burden of being tethered to a false identity, a parasitic self-definition that can only define itself in relation to blacks or others' inferiority. This is the mentality that made lynching a form of light entertainment and made it illegal for black and white people to get married or even be seen together in the street in apartheid South Africa. 
The mentality that crafted the Nuremberg Laws and gave birth to theories of vast Jewish conspiracies behind every movement in history. From the ultra-capitalist banker to the Bolshevik revolutionary, those evil crafty Jews were apparently behind it all. It takes work to fear another people that much. And while black people should be right to fear and even resent the history of white racial dominance, they should also feel, in a strange way, quite flattered by it. Despite what white supremacists claim, going to such extents as they have to prevent black excellence is really a rather huge compliment. For Jack Johnson's success to lead to the search for a great white hope is, frankly, rather pathetic. For Jesse Owens to be able to spoil the worldview of an entire nation is, again, pretty sad. Dangerous as racism is, it also makes victims out of white people, like those of my school teachers that felt threatened by a child's intelligence. I know some black and brown folk reading this will think I have gone crazy, but hear me out. As much as racism might piss me off, I'd never have wanted to have been born anyone other than myself in this culture at this time. Why? Because in spite of whatever challenges I might face, I love my people, history and culture, and I don't need Chinese people or Indians or Spaniards to not reach their full human potential to feel good about myself. That is far too much power to give another group. I can be inspired by the brilliance of Shakespeare or Stephen Hawking or Lao Tzu, and it's totally fine that they are not black. I'm sure people racialized as white, but not aggressively tethered to a supremacist identity feel similarly. So while we are often encouraged to spill our hearts about how bad racism is, as if we were its sole victims, and as if white people can't even comprehend what is going on, I'd never want to swap roles and be the one spitting on children because they look different and want to go to school, or be ready to beat a child to death because they apparently whistled at a woman of my race. Granted, these are American examples, and the US is pretty extreme in all ways, positive and negative. But the UK has not been totally free of these insanities, even domestically. So when news anchors ask about race, why not turn the anthropological lens around? Let's ask white people about whiteness on occasion, and not allow the dominant identity to remain invisible, thus retaining its mystical power. Some activists would argue that this would only centre whiteness again and is thus problematic. I am not so convinced. It would have been great had Denise Lewis or Colin Jackson asked the commentator why he felt white people could not be inspired by Usain Bolt's achievements the way that generations of writers who are not white men have been inspired by Shakespeare, Dickens, Steinbeck and Herbert. The way that football fans, whatever their country of origin, have been inspired by Maradona and Messi. The way that the millions of us, including myself, who practice Asian martial arts, have been inspired by Bruce Lee and Buakau and the monks of Shaolin. What is it this man feels about white identity that makes him opine that white people are incapable of being inspired by the excellence of people that happen to be black? And is he correct? Why does he think so little of white people? And why did his saying this in front of millions provoke little to no reaction? Whether it's Linford's lunchbox, Jack Johnson's unforgivable blackness in defeating the great white hopes, or Jesse Owens embarrassing Hitler on his own soil, the black athlete has had, and continues to have, a strange relationship with the white public imagination. In the 1960s and 1970s, Muhammad Ali occupied an iconic place in British popular culture. His legendary interview on Parkinson in 1971 exhibited such charisma and intelligence that it won him the admiration of audiences everywhere, even while he told white people that he'd frankly had enough of them. On the one hand, the black athlete has totally destroyed the myth of white genetic superiority, time and again. Yet for many, this has served not as an example of black excellence, discipline and achievement in one of the only obvious routes out of poverty for working class black youth but rather as confirmation of the existence of some deviant mystery nigger gene. Today, black athletes representing Britain is a norm. There are no more banana skins and no more bullets in the post for black footballers playing for their country. The nation has just had to get used to an England football team that is half black. And if current youth team trends are anything to go by, set to get blacker and blacker into the future. The Premier League much like the NBA and the NFL in the USA, would simply not be the brilliant spectacle it is without black athletes. Yet, 
the same institutional controversies surround them. A palpable lack of black managers and coaching staff and, of course, no owners at all in a field so disproportionately dominated by people of African heritage. Yet, there have still been scandals surrounding football and racism, even in these now golden post-banana skin years. Most famously, former Aston Villa manager Ron Atkinson calling Marcel Desailly a fucking lazy thick nigger in 2004. Atkinson was working as a commentator for ITV at the time and did not realise his mic was still recording. The comment was actually broadcast in some parts of the world. Atkinson had to resign from ITV in shame, but had the comment been made off air, we can have strong doubts whether that would have been the case. As his defence, Atkinson claimed that he was one of the first managers to give black players a chance. He obviously thought this made him sound less racist, when, of course, what it suggests is that he thinks black players need to be given a chance, i.e. they do not work hard and automatically deserve their places like others based on merit. They are given their chances by the inevitably white authority figures like him. You would never hear a manager claim he was one of the first to give white players a chance. There were several puzzling things about the episode. Not least, Big Ron's claim that it was just a mistake to have such a vitriolic phrase as lazy thick nigger ready for one apparently bad game by a footballing legend such as Marcel Desailly. Also, and predictably, a crew of black ex-players lined up around the block to defend Big Ron and let the world know that he was not really a racist. Yes, those black people do exist. Those that would rush to defend someone calling their colleague a lazy, thick nigger, but are totally silent about issues the rest of the time. At the time of writing, two separate stories around racism in football have recently broken. One involving a number of former Chelsea youth team players accusing two former coaches, Graham Ricks and Gwyn Williams, of inflicting regular racist abuse during their years at the club. It is alleged that Ricks and Williams routinely referred to black children at the club as monkeys, coons, niggers, wogs, spear chuckers, even telling one of them that if his heart was as big as their cock, he might be a great player that ran more. The other story was a confessional from England under-17 World Cup winner Rian Brewster about the regular racist abuse he has had to deal with while playing for Liverpool and England and his dismay at a lack of action from the authorities. Which brings us on to the bigger question. What is blackness? And what is it about blackness in the bigot's mind that could provoke an adult to feel so threatened by young boys in their care who dream of one day playing in the Premier League? Or provoke sexual insecurity so deep that a lynching could ensue at the mere thought of sexual intercourse between a black man and a white woman in the Jim Crow South? What I want to look at here is the construction of blackness in the racist imagination and the specific form of historical prejudice meted out to people on the grounds of having black skin or being defined as black. That hatred for darker skinned people is a global issue can be glimpsed from the beatings and discrimination meted out to African students in India or the monkey chants aimed at black footballers in Eastern Europe. Eastern Europeans were major victims of slavery, historically speaking and never embarked on racialized, globetrotting empires like their Western neighbours. Or the strange mix of fear, revulsion and intrigue that greets black people in many parts of Southeast Asia, which stopped me from getting a taxi on one of the busiest streets in South Korea for almost an hour. I asked my Korean friends if I was being paranoid, and they just laughed and said, of course not. Despite this global pattern, blackness is defined very differently from place to place. One of the reasons that I know that white people are being obtuse when they pretend to not understand something as basic as white privilege is because, being half white, I have been treated entirely differently based on the perception of my blackness in a given society. In Britain and the USA, I am racialized as black. In South Africa, I am colored. In Brazil, I am a carioca, person from Rio. Across the Caribbean, I am high colored, as previously mentioned and in all places I am treated accordingly. In Northern Africa, where I pass for a brown-skinned Amazir local, darker-skinned black people are regularly referred to as Abid, meaning slave, and I am not, because I am light enough to pass. 
It is interesting to note that even a disproportionate number of black America's revolutionary icons are lighter skinned. Malcolm, Martin, Muhammad, Angela Davis and Huey Newton. Partly reflective of the history of the one drop rule in America, in that if any of those people who are very light had been born in the Caribbean, their skin tone and the history behind it would have almost certainly meant that they would have been born middle class or aristocracy, or at least be perceived as such. If mixed race looking Malcolm X or Angela Davis were born in Jamaica, they would have been uptown people and thus had an entirely different life experience than the one they had in America, based simply on the different perceptions of the very same colours in different places. On the other hand, if you move them to Brazil, they would again be associated with those from the bottom of the society. Was part of Bob Marley's marketability his light skin? Would Obama have been elected if he had had two black parents and jet black skin? We'll never know, but I personally doubt it. But perhaps the most unusual way of setting the boundaries of blackness I have ever encountered has to be in Australia. I have toured in Australia twice and gone there to do Hip Hop Shakespeare Company work on a separate occasion. I have appeared on panels there with activists and thinkers and done workshops with school and youth groups. In Australia, I met many people that to me looked white and certainly would be perceived as such in any country I have ever visited apart from Australia. Yet they swore they were blackfellas, as Aboriginal people often call themselves, and the intensity with which they spoke about their blackness let me know they had really seen and been through some things, that they were not trying to be cool, that they really had lived blackness in the harshest sense Australia could possibly muster. How could this occur? That people literally have a white complexion, but Aboriginal features, came to be seen as black. The root of this seeming oddity, of course, has to be sought in history. From 1910 to 1970, between one in three and one in ten Aboriginal children were forcibly removed from their families to be raised either by white families or in children's homes across the country. This was a policy of forced assimilation designed to get Aboriginal Australians to forget and forego their traditional culture and language. Physical and sexual abuse were rampant. The children were functionally undereducated and were often taught that their families and community had willingly forsaken them. These victims of this process are today referred to as the stolen generations. The white-looking Aboriginal people I encountered, along with all the other gradations of mixed-looking Aboriginal blackfellas, are one of the legacies of this insane and genocidal process. No wonder they so fiercely defend their blackness when Australia had literally physically stolen their grandparents and tried to erase every aspect of their black identity. There is little doubt that today black fellas in Australia, even the nearly white looking ones, are treated and viewed more harshly than a relatively well off black British visitor such as myself is. Showing again how race and class can adapt and change depending on time and place. Australia attempted to reconcile with this history, to a degree, during the 1990s with the Bringing Them Home report and expressions of regret from the then Prime Minister, John Howard. But terrible treatment of Australia's indigenous population and the resentment that results from this treatment continue to pose a serious challenge to the country. That even black people can seriously internalise anti-black sentiment can be seen in the massive trend for skin bleaching across black communities and old Caribbean sayings such as anything too black can good. As long as whiteness is a metaphor for power, blackness must of course function as a metaphor for powerlessness. As long as money whitens, poverty must blacken. If anti-black prejudice is global, to massively varying degrees of course, has this always been the case and, if not, how did it become the case? That is what I will try to answer below. However, I would like to note that I am not going to address the caste system in India here for the simple reason that I do not know enough of that history to do it any real justice. What we are looking at then is the development of anti-black prejudice in the cultures of the Middle East, North Africa, Europe and the Americas. Interestingly, while the Bible and the Quran are both free of anti-black prejudice, in some ways the story of anti-blackness is rooted in the history of the Abrahamic faiths and sort of begins with a random Bible verse that does not even mention colour at all. 
Genesis 9.18 to 25 talks about the sons of Noah, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Ham and all his children were cursed to be slaves because, according to this verse, Ham did not cover his naked father. Despite the actual verse not mentioning Ham's colour at all, from this passage a whole mythology developed around black people being the cursed sons of Ham and therefore eternally suited for slavery, well over a thousand years before the invention of race as we think of it. While the colour symbolism of black as bad and white as good has existed for thousands of years across many cultures, including in Africa, there is no reason that this esoteric colour symbolism should have been applied to human beings' skins and social structures designed accordingly. That is something that came about more through slavery. Slavery is a common and ancient institution. It has existed right across the planet, from the largest empires to the smallest tribal groups. It has underpinned the most admired periods of European history, ancient Greece, Imperial Rome, the Florentine Renaissance, the European Enlightenment, and the Industrial Revolution. For most of history, the people doing the enslaving came from similar-ish regions of the world to those being enslaved. The very word slave comes from Slav, meaning Slavic, because so many white Eastern Europeans were enslaved by other Europeans and even sold to Muslims by them for centuries. Slavery in medieval Europe, the Mediterranean and the ancient world, though common, never came to be racial in a white-black binary sense. Even in the quintessential ancient European empire, Rome, a society partly built by plantation-style slaves, blackness and slavery never came to be widely associated. Yet when we think of slaves today, it tends to conjure images of black Africans enslaved in the Americas. The process by which this became the case has its roots in the ancient and medieval world. While a certain degree of cultural chauvinism is near universal, with the expansion of Arab Islam from the 7th century and European Christianity, first Roman from the 4th century, then Western from the 15th, that chauvinism came to be linked to the spread of a written monotheistic theology claiming to be a universal truth. While Muslim jurists, unlike their Christian counterparts, continually upheld the idea of racial equality in theory, in reality, most of the enslaved in the empires of the Islamic world came to be black. And though lighter-skinned and even white people were enslaved by the Ottoman, Abbasid, Fatimid and Moroccan empires, black slaves were particularly devalued, costing less, given the lowest jobs and in general prevented from attaining more sought-after roles as easily as their lighter-skinned counterparts. As for the women, who made up most of the enslaved in these regions, unlike later in the Americas, they were seen as less beautiful than their white European fellow slaves, with the notable exception of the Abyssinians. Slavery in the Islamic world then, perhaps more than any other region, meant many and vastly differing states of exploitation. In the classical Islamic societies, this included conditions ranging from the Derv Shimeh of the Ottomans, who were European Christian slaves educated for administrative service, some of whom rose through the ranks of Ottoman society to be grand viziers, to widespread use of military slaves, household servants, women of the harem, eunuchs, and, at the very bottom, black plantation slaves, such as in the Egyptian cotton boom of the 1860s, the clove plantations of Oman in the 19th century, or the salt flats of Basra in the 9th century, where the famous revolt of the Zanj, blacks, occurred. Many of the early Islamic world's greatest thinkers, Ibn Khaldun, Al-Idrisi, Ibn Sina, to name but a few, can be found exhibiting a similar kind of anti-black prejudice that we would see in European Christendom and the Enlightenment. Ibn Khaldun, for example, opined that blacks are dumb animals naturally suited to slavery. It must also be said that in the Greco-Roman world and in early Islamic societies, black people can be seen occupying all kinds of social and professional roles. And the ancient Greeks, Aristotle, Herodotus, Theodorus, etc., seem to think that the ancient Egyptians, who they saw with their own eyes, were black people. Within early Europe, we see images of famous black saints like Maurice and even black Madonnas. In the Islamic world, there were black scholars, revered generals, and even powerful dynasties in northern Africa and Muslim Spain. And of course, several West African societies and empires adopted and Africanized Islam. Yet, from the 2nd century onwards, 
Ethiopians, a generic term for black people that has no relationship to the country that today bears the name, fairly consistently came to be represented as living in the dark, as in sin, and as representative of evil demons and even the devil itself. In the 15th century, Mediterranean and Iberian slavery was still common and while slavery in the Iberian Peninsula of the 15th century was not of the exclusively racial type, we find in Seville in the 1470s the Casa Negra, the House of the Blacks, which appears to be a kind of charity set up by black people to buy the freedom of their enslaved kinsmen. I use quote marks this way because there is no reason to assume that they all came from the same ethnic group, but their shared sense of blackness as expressed by their charity's title and the common experience of slavery had bound them together much as it would for other black people in the new world over the coming centuries. Yet it would seem that black people were still a minority of the enslaved population in southern Spain at the time. As the states of Iberian Europe, and particularly Portugal, started to trade down the West African coast from the mid-15th century, Europeans did not find entirely backward or savage cultures that they were universally revolted by. In fact, some observers compared African towns and cities of the period with those of Europe and explicitly thought their African business partners to be civilized and cultured. Prejudice, stereotype and a sense of difference there certainly was, but systemic racism was not even possible before the technological gap between Africa and Europe and the slavery, massacres and domination that technology gap made possible became a chasm. Meanwhile, in the Americas, the curse of Ham was applied and linked to a philosophy based on Plato and Aristotle's ideas about natural slaves to inform the largest and most intense experiments with industrial scale slavery in human history. After the indigenous people of the Caribbean had been all but wiped out by Spanish brutality and European diseases, Africans began to be brought in as slaves. The earliest black people brought to labour in the Caribbean actually came from Spain. Reflecting the earlier Mediterranean and Trans-Saharan slave routes and the earliest plantation labour in the Caribbean and America was, for a brief period at least, multiracial. But for a whole host of reasons, such as a reluctance to enslave Indians on their own land, decimation would do just fine, Ottoman suzerainty in the Mediterranean, cutting off the supply of white Slavs to the Iberian Peninsula, the strength of state formations in Western Europe eradicating the possibility of enslaving the populations of rival European nations, the comparative military and economic weaknesses of West African states, and of course, hatred and fear of black people, slavery in the Americas came to be an exclusively black affair. The European prejudices about blackness and evil were by no means fixed or without contradiction, but by now they were over a millennium old and could be redeployed to serve a purpose, in the process clearly violating a professed Christian ethic of universal brotherhood. Black slavery in the Americas, then, was by no means inevitable. Indeed, the first Spanish governor of Hispaniola, a man named Ovando requested that his king outlaw the enslavement of blacks as they were apparently too troublesome and caused white indentured servants and the natives to rebel. And it seems for a brief while that the Spanish monarchs obliged. The myth of the docile African, as you will see in later chapters, has no basis in history and African resistance both in Africa and across the Americas limited the scale of the traffic significantly just as African collaborators and slave traders fed it. Once slavery in the Americas was exclusively reserved for humans of African origin, black skin became a signal of merchandise rather than humanity, property rather than personhood, and thus anti-blackness became one of the bedrocks of the emergent capitalist economies of Western Europe and North America. The decimation of indigenous Americans and the theft of their land, combined with the literal working to death of millions of Africans and access to new world metals, are no small part in the history of Western development, however much committed ideologues may try to pretend otherwise. Cotton, sugar, tobacco, coffee, the primary commodities of their days, were produced by human commodities with black skin, under what Sven Becker rightly calls war capitalism. It wasn't free trade or open markets, but military rule, forced servitude, national monopolies and absolutely no semblance of democracy that helped modern Europe and America 
to develop. Racism gave slave owners the justification for an unprecedented experiment in the denial of liberty and forced servitude, and thus racism, far from being marginal or just a side effect, has been absolutely central to developing Euro-American prosperity. An estimated 12 million Africans, at the very least, were transported in floating dungeons across the Atlantic from the mid-15th to 19th centuries. Countless numbers of them died en route to the African coast and also during the horrendous Middle Passage. The idea that black Africans were savage heathens and thus slavery was a good and necessary stage in preparing them for civilization became so embedded in Euro-Christian thought that even some abolitionists accepted and parroted the idea. However, even as late as the mid-18th century, it was still rare for a European observer even those heavily involved with slavery on the African coast, to assert that black people were not human. Inferior, perhaps. Heathens, for sure. But up until this point, the humanity of Africans had rarely been questioned. This may seem strange given the inhumane treatment intrinsic to enslavement, but again we must realise that inhumane treatment of the lower orders was the norm in Europe at this time. In Britain, for example, poor people were still regularly hanged for small property theft or transported to Australia in horrendous conditions and violently ejected from their lands so that those lands could be enclosed in a manner that would be repeated in the settler colonies of the future. Though, of course, the dehumanization of anti-black racism gave transatlantic chattel slavery a particular sadism. The turning point towards a scientific and systematic racism came when writers like Edward Long a British Jamaican slave owner started to justify the plantation regime on the grounds that black people were not just inferior, but that they were not even human. An orangutan husband would not disgrace a Negro woman, long opined, an early example of the obsession with comparing black Africans to monkeys. Mr. Long's work would seem so silly to any rational person today that it is hard to believe that some of the brightest minds of the 18th century took it entirely seriously. But they did. And an entire corpus of supposedly scientific racism was spawned that sorted humanity into gradations of race and even excluded some groups from the ranks of humanity altogether. These theories could be used to justify what we would now call genocide. With the dehumanization made legally explicit in Britain with cases such as that of the infamous slave ship Zong, where 133 Africans were thrown overboard when the ship got into difficulty. Disposing of the enslaved people in this way meant that their owners could claim insurance on their property. But the insurance company refused to pay up, solely on the grounds that the goods had been discarded deliberately. Only when the legal dispute rumbled on did abolitionists argue that the crew should be charged with murder. But both cases were fought on the grounds that the drowned peoples represented goods, not humans and the judge concluded that, so far from the guilt of anything like a murderous act, so far from any show or suggestion of cruelty, there was not even a surmise of impropriety and that to bring a charge of murder would argue nothing less than madness. In all fairness to those who investigated race scientifically, they were not all of Mr. Long's level of bigotry, or Kant, or Hume, or Voltaire's for that matter, and they certainly were not all slave owners and the process by which fully racist ideas, if I can call them that, caught on was long and complex. For example, in 1813, Dr. James Cowles Pritchard, perhaps the top British student of race science at the time, could be found saying quite the opposite of Mr. Long. On the whole, it appears that we may, with a high degree of probability, draw the inference that all the different races into which the human species is divided originated from one family. Dr. Pritchard was part of a school of scientists known as the monogeneticists, who were guided by Christian ideas about the brotherhood of man and concluded that all humanity descended from Adam and thus were branches of the same family. But later in the 19th century, Ironically, in the years following the abolition of slavery, ideas like Mr. Long's, ideas that some groups of people, particularly black people, were not really human, started to hold sway. These ideas were generally promoted by the polygenicists, who believed in several separate origins for the different races of man. The legacy of 
scientific thinking about race included the human zoos in Paris, London, New York and Brussels that still existed in some form as late as the 1950s, as well as the banana skins and monkey chants for black football players that I grew up watching. While some scholars have taken to locating the origins of anti-black racism in the plantation economies of the Americas, or as a simple byproduct of capitalist greed, it seems more accurate to say that the prejudices that made New World slavery's exclusively anti-black nature possible had much deeper roots in European history and culture, and had long precedence in other regions of the world, most notably the Middle East and North Africa. As slavery continues in Northern Africa today, and as barely disguised semi-slavery continues in the prisons of the United States, the legacies of the invention of blackness are all too apparent and alive, from the Brazilian favela to the Johannesburg slum. The collection of prejudices attached to black people invariably involve the fear of the supposed hyperpotency and special sexual endowment of black men, rather ironic given their alleged inferiority, and the variants of these ideas applied to black women. Even though the obsession with Limpford's lunchbox, eugenics-based slavery sprint films, and the odd relationship between white audiences and black heavyweight champions may seem rather unconnected, a study of the history of scientific racism quickly reveals the glue that binds these episodes and issues. But blackness also had another trajectory, an alternative origin and a very different set of definitions. Prior to colonialism, Black Africans seem to have found their blackness perfectly beautiful and normal, unsurprisingly. But also, by making whiteness the colour of oppression, the colour that defined a person's right to own other human beings, to rape and kill and steal with impunity, white supremacists had paradoxically opened up the way for blackness to become the colour of freedom, of revolution and of humanity. This is why it's absurd to compare black nationalism and white nationalism. Not because black people are inherently moral, but because the projects of the two nationalisms were entirely different. This difference is the reason why black nationalist Muhammad Ali could still risk his life, give up the prime years of his career and lose millions of dollars in solidarity with the non-black, non-American people of Vietnam. It's also why Ali could show as much sympathy as he did to the white people of Ireland in their quarrels with Britain, despite him saying somewhat rhetorically that the white man is the devil. The most dramatic example of the revolutionary human capacities of black nationalism comes very early in its history in Haiti where, after the only successful slave revolution in human history, the independent black government made the white Polish and Germans who aided the revolution legally black in 1804. The revolutionary and oppositional nature of black identity is also part of why so many millions of people racialized as white are inspired by black culture, music and art, in spite of all the racist propaganda that they have been exposed to, asserting that these people, and thus their culture, are inferior. It's why John Lennon, great as he was, can never be a symbol of freedom for black people in the way that Bob Marley, Nina Simone or Muhammad Ali are for so many white people. These visions and understandings of blackness are why, in spite of living in a world indelibly shaped by white supremacy, the most recognised icons of freedom in the English-speaking world in the 20th century, Ali, Malcolm, Marley, Martin, were disproportionately black, apart from Che Guevara. Indeed, the two most famous black nationalists of all time, Bob Marley and Muhammad Ali, are loved by countless millions of people of all ethnicities all over the world. The fact that such outspoken, uncompromisingly anti-white supremacist political figures as Ali and Mali are also global humanist icons shows quite clearly the innate difference between black nationalism and white nationalism as political imperatives. For mainstream white society to deal with this obvious fact, journalists, media and fans would have to acknowledge that white supremacy is an obviously anti-human idea. So instead, Marley is more often reduced to little more than a weed-smoking hippie whose only song and political sentiment was apparently one love. But the idea that different nationalisms are different in intent and content depending on their historical origins is not a difficult concept to understand. For example, the SMP and the BMP 
whilst both made up of white British people, could not be more different. Whilst there are plenty of bigots in Scotland, Scottish nationalism in our times is rooted in a rejection of English superiority and a refusal to be dictated to by Westminster, rather than in the same racist imperial fantasies that nourish so much British nationalism. Whilst I have a million criticisms of the SNP, if I lived in Scotland, I might well vote for them. I could obviously never vote for the BNP. Anyway, I digress. Blackness continues to represent traditions of resistance and rebellion, such that even today, when young people in Britain who are not black wish to participate in an oppositional culture, they flock to hip-hop and grime, and before that, reggae, in a way that black youngsters never did and never will to punk or grunge, much as we may personally like both genres. The culture and music of Afro-Caribbean migrants to Britain and our American cousins has invariably been the one culture that has brought young people of all walks of life together. Blackness is both despised and highly valued. It's rarely acknowledged by any of the parties involved that the roots of this contradiction are both the prison whiteness has created for its adherents and the revolutionary power of blackness. However, the almost universal failure of white music artists, apart from Eminem, to even attempt to address the contradictions of white identity, alongside black artists' constant willingness to put blackness front and centre, suggests that all parties understand the racial dynamics at play much better than they seem willing to admit. Chapter 5. Empire and Slavery in the British Memory I think he would be very proud of the continuing legacy of Britain in those places around the world, and particularly I think he would be amazed at India, the world's largest democracy. A stark contrast, of course, with other less fortunate countries that haven't had the benefit of British rule. If I can say this on the record, why not? It's true, it's true. Boris Johnson, of Winston Churchill, on whom he has just finished writing a book. I am strongly in favour of using poison gas against uncivilised tribes. It would spread a lively terror. I hate Indians. They are a beastly people with a beastly religion. Winston Churchill Come over here, Kingsley, my teacher's Canadian voice called excitedly as she beckoned me towards her. She was never usually nice to me, so I was a bit suspicious about her calling me over with such enthusiasm. When I got close enough, she put her hand on the shoulder of my seven-year-old self with just the right weight of touch to communicate the monumental solemnity of the occasion. Pointing to the painting on the wall, she said, Kingsley, and then drew in a dramatic breath to add power to the punchline. This man stopped slavery. She managed to pull her eyes away from the picture and turn them in my direction, her gaze instructing me to be thankful. She expected me to share in her joy, but I was just thoroughly confused. What? All by himself, miss? I asked. Don't you mean he helped? Her face distorted and she took the exact same flustered breath that liberals everywhere would take in 2008, right before they were about to lecture any black person who had the gall to declare themselves a non-supporter of Barack Obama. I was there in 2008. I was one such sinner. I know that face of, you can't possibly know what is good for you, and how could you be so ungrateful? Very well. No, Kingsley, he stopped slavery, she retorted, clearly annoyed at my refusal to blindly accept what I was being told. We were on a school visit to the National Portrait Gallery, and the painting on the wall was of one Mr. William, patron saint of black emancipation, Wilberforce. I did not have the strength or wherewithal to argue back with my teacher. I was only seven after all. But I knew her statement was absurd, hence the memory staying put. By what force of magic could an educated adult be compelled to believe that one man, all by himself, could put an end to a few centuries of tricontinental, multi-million pound business enterprise and genocide by the sheer force of his moral convictions? What's more... Why would this teacher try to convince me, of all the students in our class, of such an absurdity? I was not the only child of Caribbean origin in our class, so it could not have been a let's-just-pick-out-the-black-kid scenario. 
But I was the only one who went to Pan-African Saturday school and thus had demonstrated a particular penchant for challenging what I was being taught. Courtesy of that community schooling, by the time this teacher was telling me that Wilberforce had set Africans free, I already had some knowledge of the rebel slaves known as Maroons across the Caribbean and of the Haitian Revolution. So I had some idea that the enslaved had not just sat around waiting for Wilberforce, or anyone else for that matter, to come and save them. While it's certainly true that Britain had a popular abolitionist movement to a far greater degree than the other major slaveholding powers in Europe at the time, and this is in its own way interesting and remarkable, generations of Brits have been brought up to believe what amount to little more than fairy tales with regard to the abolition of slavery. If you learn only three things during your education in Britain about transatlantic slavery, there will be 1. Wilberforce set Africans free. 2. Britain was the first country to abolish slavery, and it did so for primarily moral reasons. 3. Africans sold their own people. The first two of these statements are total nonsense. The third is a serious oversimplification. What does it say about this society that, after two centuries of being one of the most successful human traffickers in history, the only historical figure to emerge from this entire episode as a household name is a parliamentary abolitionist. Even though the names of many of these human traffickers surround us on the streets and buildings bearing their names, stare back at us through the opulence of their country estates still standing as monuments to King Sugar, and live on in the institutions and infrastructure built partly from their profits, insurance, modern banking, railways. None of their names have entered the national memory to anything like the degree that Wilberforce has. In fact, I sincerely doubt that most Brits could name a single soul involved with transatlantic slavery other than Wilberforce himself. The ability for collective, selective amnesia in the service of easing a nation's cognitive dissonance is nowhere better exemplified than in the manner that much of Britain has chosen to remember transatlantic slavery in particular and the British Empire more generally. My Wilberforce moment was not unique or isolated but springs from this larger tradition of extremely selective recall that Brits tend to call propagandistic when it occurs in other nations. For example, in 2007, on the bicentenary of the abolition of the Slave Trade Act, the government and media organised a season of celebration and commemoration. Tony Blair expressed his deep sorrow and regret about Britain's involvement with slavery, but stopped short of an apology. And a glut of articles appeared across the press asking if Britain should apologise, most of which inevitably regurgitated the we were the first to abolish, why can't you just get over it line. The only major film to emerge from these festivities was, of course, one about Wilberforce, predictably titled Amazing Grace, after the redemptive hymn written by the English slave trader John Newton. The film depicts a simple Hollywood-style narrative of one brave and visionary soul who challenges the dominant and powerful interests of his day and in the end wins them over with his plucky righteousness. There were some other voices during this abolition season including my sister, who presented a documentary about the Jamaican Maroons on BBC Two, but those voices were extremely faint in comparison to the Wilberforce chorus that echoed across the nation. Black activists and scholars were offended by the Wilberforce-centric narrative, so much so that community activist and founder of Legali.org, Toyin Agbetu, was compelled to make an entire independent documentary calling into question what was dubbed the Wilberfest. Agbetu and others were responding not just to the 2007 celebration, but to the longer tradition of miseducation and to programs such as the 2005 BBC doc, The Slavery Business, where the presenter tells the viewer that, in 1807, Britain did something remarkable. It ended the slave trade and turned its back on its enormous profits. This was largely down to one man. This childishly idyllic, and completely inaccurate sentence, is largely representative of mainstream narratives around abolition. A couple more examples will suffice to make the point. In the conclusion to his 900-page tome, The Atlantic Slave Trade, the historian Hugh Thomas fails to even mention slave resistance as a factor in abolition at all, lists a number of European abolitionists, and of course positions Britain as the abolitionist-in-chief, 
apparently motivated by pangs of conscience and nothing more. Thomas also asserts that the slave trade went on as long as it did because Africans, apart from Muslim ones, apparently, were good-natured and usually docile. In recent years, three separate schools in different parts of the country have made headlines because of their teaching and remembrance of slavery. Two of the schools gave their students worksheets that were essentially business plans for buying and selling African people as slaves, and a teacher at another school thought it would be a good idea to get children to come in dressed as slaves for Black History Month. Even Bob Gildoff, our very own latter-day Wilberforce, this generation's chief white saviour in command, is not above this kind of reductionist rhetoric when it comes to Africans. In his series, Gildoff in Africa, we see him strolling along the shores of a West African beach, telling the viewer that Europeans came to Africa in search of gold. But, to their eternal shame, what the Africans had to sell was their own people. Gildoff may well not have written the script, but he said the words. So what are the facts then? Did Wilberforce do it all by himself? Was Britain the first nation to abolish slavery? And were Africans queuing up on the shores of the Atlantic to sell their own children to the highest bidder? No, no, and no. Britain quite simply was not the first nation to abolish transatlantic slavery. Denmark did so in 1792, and France briefly abolished slavery during the height of the French Revolution in 1794. What was abolitionist Britain's response to these abolitions? Was it to quickly follow suit? No. The British government's response was to send its armies to the Caribbean to invade French-held islands and to try and reinstall slavery everywhere the French had abolished it. This conflict with France included imprisoning some 2,000 black French fighters in Porchester Castle, among them some of the most prominent black abolitionists of the era. And this at a time when the entire black British population was somewhere between 10 and 15,000. The British invasion of the French Caribbean included an invasion of Haiti, which is particularly significant given Haiti's place in the history of the period. During the 1780s, Haiti was by far the most profitable slave colony in the Americas, exporting as much sugar as Brazil, Cuba and Jamaica combined, producing half the world's coffee and generating more revenue than the entire 13 colonies of what had just become America. Haiti or Saint-Domingue, as it was then known, was the pearl of the Antilles, the cash cow that allowed the French Empire to still compete with the British. To capture such a prize would have been a massive boost for both the British Empire and for the continuation of industrial-scale racialized slavery. As it panned out, formerly enslaved Africans fighting under the French flag were able to defeat the British armies and retake the portions of the island Britain had won, reinstalling slavery as they went, remember. This mass campaign for re-enslavement in the Caribbean was undertaken by none other than Prime Minister William Pitt, the very same man who would encourage Wilberforce to front the abolitionist campaign in Parliament just a few years later. In fact, Pitt himself raised the question of abolition of the slave trade in Parliament before even Wilberforce. The Caribbean campaigns of the 1790s proved to be one of the greatest military disasters in British imperial history, with defeats, setbacks and unwanted treaties undertaken right across the Caribbean. British troop losses are estimated to have been at least 50,000, by some estimates quite substantially more. It is absolutely inconceivable that Britain would have suddenly had a moral epiphany in 1807 if they had won Haiti from the French, making them undisputed masters of the Caribbean by holding the two most important Caribbean colonies of the time, Haiti and Jamaica. Remember, at this point, America had only just won its independence, a fact about which Britain was less than happy, see the War of 1812, and was not yet a global power like Britain and France. Just a few short years later, France would renege on its temporary abolitionist principles and attempt to re-enslave the people of Haiti, the same people who had fought and defeated the Spanish and the British and kept the island for France. Toussaint Louverture had proved his willingness to accommodate the French planters, even to the point of letting them keep their plantations and forcing former slaves to continue to work for them, albeit with meagre pay but Napoleon just could not bring himself to work on anything resembling equal terms with a Negro. 
Legend has it that on his deathbed, Napoleon said, I should have recognised Toussaint. Britain helpfully removed the naval blockade it had previously had in place in the English Channel during the years of war with France to allow French troops, headed up by Napoleon's brother-in-law, to travel to Haiti and try and put the gilded Negroes back in their rightful place. The latest British Prime Minister, Henry Addington, said, We must destroy Jacobinism, especially that of the blacks. The British governor of Jamaica sent weapons and assistance to the French mission in Haiti. Like Addington, he understood that the preservation of slavery and white supremacy, even that of their French rivals, was preferable to empowering abolitionist-minded rebel Negroes. Once the French realised, as predicted at the time by the British abolitionist James Stephen, and by the Haitians themselves, that the Haitians could not be re-enslaved, the French plan was to exterminate them all and start over again with newly enslaved people brought from Africa. The war that ensued became an explicitly genocidal one, in which the French troops were instructed to exterminate all of the blacks on the island. This extermination attempt included the massacre of families and surrendered soldiers, the elderly and the sick, but the French also excelled themselves in the range of human barbarities they introduced with this war. These included turning ships into gas chambers, mass drowning, Toussaint Louverture's brother and his family died this way, and importing thousands of dogs from Cuba that had been trained to eat people. None of this savagery cowered the Haitians, rather it appears to have only emboldened them. French soldiers and observers have left many terrified records from the period. The formerly enslaved African and Creole, Haitian-born slaves, and their allies, the Maroons, the free people of colour and the Polish defectors, defeated the French just as they had defeated Spain and Britain before them and Haiti declared itself independent in 1804. This was the first and only successful slave revolution in human history and only the second colony in the Americas to be free of European rule. Haiti abolished slavery immediately upon independence, 30 years before Britain would do so in its Caribbean possessions, and became the first state in the world to outlaw racism in its constitution, despite everything done in the name and practice of white supremacy on the island over the preceding centuries. As alluded to earlier, the Haitians in fact went one step further than merely outlawing racism and declared that the whites, in reality Polish and some Germans, that had fought with the revolution were now officially black. Honorary blacks, if you will. Britain and the other major Atlantic powers, France and the USA, refused to recognise the independent black republic despite its abolition of slavery. In fact, because of this very abolition. And despite their willingness to recognise the newly created nations that would rebel against Spanish rule in the coming decades. To add bitterness to this irony, it was the newly independent black state of Haiti that aided Simon Bolivar in his attempts to liberate South America from the Spanish providing him with money, arms and military expertise with the condition that he free the enslaved in any territories that he liberated. Yet the states Bolivar created were recognised more quickly than was Haiti itself. Clearly, whatever the British government's abolitionist convictions, they did not extend to recognising the nationhood of the only state in human history founded by rebel slaves who'd won their freedom. Furthermore, Abolitionist Britain stood by as France and then the US repeatedly punished Haiti for winning its freedom and its abolition of slavery. Under the threat of re-invasion, the French extorted a debt from Haiti in 1825 of 91 million gold francs for the loss of their property, i.e. the Haitians themselves. It took up to 1947 to pay this debt and in fact Haiti had to borrow the money to pay the debt from French banks. After independence, Haiti was afflicted by a series of fratricidal wars between the various revolutionaries that often had a racial overtone to them, blacks versus mulattoes, and the legacy of that colour-based slave-era privilege still afflicts every former slave colony to this day. The USA then invaded Haiti in 1915, removing the stipulation in the Haitian constitution that prevented foreign whites from owning land there, killing 15,000 Haitians and backing a brutal dictatorship for the best part of the 20th century. 
And then, when Haiti finally went to the polls, the USA collaborated with the Haitian elite to have their democratically elected leader overthrown. Twice. To my knowledge, no senior British government official uttered even so much of a word in protest about any of this, though we can all be sure they would have found their moral indignation about human rights if Russia or Iran had been the culprits. But the duplicity of the British government as it relates to abolition did not end with attempts to crush the Haitian Revolution. Upon abolition in its own colonies, it was the slave owners who were given compensation to the tune of £20 million, roughly £17 billion in today's money, the largest public bailout until the aftermath of the 2008 banking crisis. The formerly enslaved were given nothing. In fact, they were expected to remain slaves for five more years under a system euphemistically entitled apprenticeship. And of course, East Indian coolies continued to be scattered across the Caribbean to labour as indentured servants well after the abolition of slavery. We must remind ourselves that we are talking about a period of British history where it took almost a century of debate, reform and much consternation to abolish domestic child labour. Are we to really believe that a British Parliament that had only just come to abolish the labour of its own children felt such a loving affinity for faraway Negroes? Furthermore, when the enslaved in the British Caribbean struck out for their freedom, sometimes in the mistaken belief that the British government had actually set them free, how did the local arms of the British state respond? After the 1807 Act, there were a series of major slave rebellions in the British Caribbean. First, in Barbados in 1816, Demerara, British Guiana, in 1823, and then Jamaica's Baptist War in 1831. The Baptist War was the largest rebellion in the history of the British Caribbean, involving perhaps as many as 60,000 rebels. The genuine fear that Jamaica and other territories might go the same way as Haiti cannot be overstated. Indeed, had the Jamaican Maroons not helped the British forces put down the rebellion, it may well have developed into a full revolution. In response to that rebellion, Lord Howick, Under Secretary for the Colonies and the son of Prime Minister Lord Grey, wrote to the new governor of Jamaica that his information was that the slaves were not being in the least intimidated or cowed by the dreadfully severe punishments which had been inflicted, but on the contrary, as being quite careless of their lives and as regarding death as infinitely preferable to slavery. While they are exasperated to the highest degree and burning for revenge for the fate of their friends and relations, it is quite clear that the present state of things cannot go on much longer and that every hour that it does so is full of the most appalling danger. My own conviction is that emancipation alone will effectively avert the danger and that the reformed parliament will very speedily come to that measure, but in the meantime it is but too possible that the simultaneous murder of the whites upon every estate which Mr Nib apprehends may take place. It is an odd way to express one's love for an oppressed class of people, to leave them in conditions so horrendous that they have no choice but to rebel, and then, rather than ameliorate those conditions, remember, £20 million was found for slave masters, to engage in mass executions of the very same people one had apparently set free out of sheer and undying love. The British government's treatment of its own rebel slaves and its refusal to recognise abolitionist Haiti contrasts sharply with its relationship with the slave-owning confederacy, Brazil and Cuba. For decades after abolition, Britain imported countless tonnes of slave-made cotton from the American South, which stimulated all kinds of industries, and British banks and businessmen made a mint investing in slave-owned mines and slave-built infrastructure in Brazil. Brazil and Cuba did not abolish slavery until the 1880s, but still received massive inward investment from British companies and merchants with the government's knowledge, of course. But in perhaps the most treacherous episode of the whole affair, the British anti-slavery squadron, tasked with enforcing abolition on the seas, received head money for each African they liberated. So no, it was not altruism. And they sometimes even sold the Africans they liberated back into slavery. Finally, slavery was not abolished in British colonies like Hong Kong, Aden and Sierra Leone until well into the 20th century. So, 
Despite Britain spending almost two centuries as the dominant transatlantic slave trader, with all the torture, rape and mass murder that entailed, despite Britain refusing to back abolition when other European powers had paved the way, despite Britain spending the 1790s warring to keep slavery intact all over the Caribbean, despite Britain trying to crush the only successful slave revolution in human history, and then helping their French enemies attempt to do the same, despite Britain refusing to even recognise the first Caribbean state to abolish slavery, despite all of this, some historians, teachers and assorted nationalists are asking us all to believe the self-serving fairy tale that suddenly, in 1807, just three years after Haitian independence, guided by William Wilberforce alone, Britain abolished slavery because it was the right thing to do. What a pile of twaddle. But the Wilberforce did it all idea also springs from two other ideological founts. One, the aforementioned classic white saviour trope, and the other, a seemingly human need for simple solutions to complex problems, for great men instead of the convoluted mess that is human history. In short, a need for heroes. Unfortunately, very little of human history is unsullied by the grit of reality and no humans are free from imperfections. Even if we take a far more prominent abolitionist than Wilberforce, a man who literally shed his blood for the cause of abolition, Toussaint Louverture, we see these human imperfections and contradictions. Born into slavery, but free by age 30, the charismatic and militarily brilliant leader of what became the Haitian Revolution was at one time a slave owner. He instituted a draconian labour regime when he was governor of Haiti, had his own adopted nephew executed for being too unkind to French planters, slave owners, and even snitched to the British about a slave revolt brewing in Jamaica, of which the suspected instigators were hanged. Louverture, nonetheless, did shed his blood and spent much of his adult life literally fighting for the abolition of slavery. Humans are complex. I suppose the difference between Wilberforce and Louverture in this respect, other than the obvious fact that Louverture's contribution was far greater, is that even the most hagiographic writings on Louverture would not dare to suggest he did it all by himself. Any analysis of the endings of Caribbean slavery that fails to even mention the only successful slave revolution in history and the wider phenomenon of slave resistance, as well as multiple other factors, is not to be taken at all seriously. There is also the glaring contradiction of the creation of apartheid semi-slave states in southern Africa that stayed in existence well into the 20th century and which took a combination of armed struggle, protest and worldwide boycott to formally topple. If the British government abolished the slave trade way back in 1807 because of an inherent love for justice and for African human beings, how do we explain the British government backing apartheid rule? which did not end until I was seven years old. Remember that a regime of forced labour based on white supremacy was the cornerstone of apartheid. Let's be totally clear though, I am not disputing that Wilberforce played a role in the abolition of the Slave Trade Act passing in 1807, nor am I disputing that for all its contours and complications that the abolition acts were steps forward, nor that some Britons did indeed have genuine anti-slavery principles back then. Some much more demonstrably so than Wilberforce, such as Foxwell Buxton or Clarkson or the British workers that went on strike against slave-made cotton, and of course the black British abolitionists living and publishing in England at the time, such as Mary Prince, Otto Barker Guano and Alada Equiano. What I am saying is that power concedes nothing without demand or motive, and the abolitionist movement needs to be viewed much like the anti-war movements of today if you will forgive the crude historical parallel. Think of it like this. There are today British citizens, perhaps millions of us, who, however fringe we may be considered in mainstream politics, are genuinely horrified at our government's foreign policy, its arms dealing and warmongering. And there are also a few rogue MPs who constantly vote against the British war machine. But does any of that mean that the British ruling class generally take anti-war humanitarianism at all seriously? Of course not. This is how they can support terrorists in Libya while claiming to save Libyans with humanitarian bombs and then let people fleeing from Libya 
drown in the sea while the foreign secretary makes jokes about clearing away the dead bodies to a laughing audience. Or how they can sell arms to the Saudis for them to kill Yemeni civilians at the exact same time that they are waging war in Syria under the rubric of humanitarianism. The times have changed, and the extremities of the crimes may be different and a little less direct, but the narrative and Machiavellian mentality have remained much the same. No one refers to the white man's burden anymore, as it's just too crude a phrase. So instead we speak of spreading democracy and human rights and of saving people from dictators, which, funnily enough, is almost exactly what the original 19th century version of the white man's burden claimed to be motivated by. The scramble for Africa was justified in largely humanitarian terms. Europeans needed to go in and save Africans from their slave-dealing elites, apparently. There is no doubt, of course, that these slave-dealing elites existed in Africa. They had been Britain's business partners, after all. But the idea that the scramble for Africa saved the African masses is so ridiculous that even the most nationalistic of historians would find it hard to spin. And here we come to the old adage, the third slavery fact we learned in school and offered to us again by Gildoff and so many others. Africans sold their own people. There are a number of obvious problems with the Africans sold their own people cliche, but that still does not seem to have stopped people offering it as an argument. First and foremost, does the fact that Britain had African accomplices rid it of any and all wrongdoing? According to many, it does. Second, there was no continental African identity before industrial technology, the scramble for Africa, the redrawing of borders and the modern pan-Africanist movement created it in the 20th century. And that African identity is still fraught with contradictions and conflicts. Between the 16th and 19th centuries, Africa was not a paradise where all humans sat together around the campfire in their loincloths, singing Kumbaya in one huge, but obviously primitive, black kingdom covering the entire continent and littered with quaint-looking mud huts any more than all of Europe or Asia was one big happy family. Africa had and has ethnic, cultural, class and imperial rivalries that every scholar of the period acknowledges are the very divisions that colonizers and slave traders played on. In fact, as the award-winning historian Sylvian A. Diouf notes, in none of the slave narratives that have survived do the formerly enslaved talk about being sold by other Africans or by their own people. And only Sancho, who lived in England, even mentions the blackness of those that sold him. The victims of the transatlantic traffic did not think that they were being sold out by their black brothers and sisters any more than the Irish thought that their white brothers and sisters from England were deliberately starving them to death during the famine. Oral traditions collected in eastern Nigeria in the 1960s speak of local groups that considered a particular family to be cursed because they had sold a daughter into slavery several generations ago. Such treachery would hardly be considered grounds for a centuries-long curse if it were the norm. Even the major slave-trading states of Western Africa, Oyo, Dahomey, Ashanti, all passed laws banning or limiting the sale of their own citizens, i.e. their own people while they of course continued to raid for and sell other nations' people. The early kings of the Congo wrote letters to Portuguese monarchs pleading with them to stop sending traders because they were taking away people, and only sent teachers and priests instead. And Benin, one of the most impressive West African states of the period, seems to have been the only one that successfully protected its own citizens from the beginning of the trade. We need not romanticize pre-colonial Africa. We are not all descendants of kings and queens. Most of us whose ancestors were sold into slavery are probably descended from serfs, servants, existing slaves and soldiers from warring parties. With that said, it is interesting that Alada Equiano made such a huge distinction between the kind of slavery that existed in African kingdoms and the kind practiced in the Americas. Countless European witnesses made this same observation, that... African slavery was nothing like the racialized chattel slavery practiced on the sugar plantations of the New World, including English slave traders like John Newton. The state of slavery among these wild, barbarous people, 
as we esteem them, is much milder than in our colonies. For as, on the one hand, they have no land in high cultivation like our West Indian plantations, and therefore no call for that excessive, unintermitted labour which exhausts our slaves. So, on the other hand, no man is permitted to draw blood, even from a slave. Which brings us to Hugh Thomas's assertion that Africans were docile. Reflecting the unscholarly value judgment embedded in that statement, neither Hugh Thomas nor any others who peddle it offer any comparative data to try and prove the claim. They do not, for example, attempt to show that enslaved people in the Greco-Roman world, the European Dark Ages, 18th century Russia or medieval Korea were any more likely to rebel than Africans. In fact, Specialists in studies of global slavery note just how relatively rare slave rebellions were across all slave societies, for what should be obvious reasons to a scholar. However, perhaps the most neglected area of study in the whole history of transatlantic slavery is the issue of resistance to enslavement in Africa itself. Most people are at least vaguely aware that there was some resistance from black people in the Caribbean, but it's always fascinated me that people, even many in the black diaspora, seem willing to believe that Africans, undifferentiated by class, region or ethnicity, just allowed their family members to be taken away, or worse, that they were all collaborators. Thanks to decades of painstaking research, we know this is fundamentally untrue. There were literally hundreds of rebellions and attacks against slave ships up and down the West African coast carried out by organized guerrilla groups much like the Maroons of the Caribbean. As many as 483 of these rebellions are recorded in British, French and Dutch records alone. The average death toll in these skirmishes seems to have been about 25 and the historian David Richardson estimates that a million fewer people had to go through the Middle Passage because of this one form of resistance alone. It is also estimated that one in every ten European slave ships to dock in West Africa experienced either a shipboard revolt or an attack from land. It is notable that there were not any major rebellions against transportation to penal colonies let alone a revolution in the UK during all the years that Britons were being shipped against their will to Australia and elsewhere. But I will not suggest that this is because white Brits are uniquely docile, as there are several other more likely possible explanations. The British state was too well armed, class divisions were too strong, people were too divided. In two final examples of how complex the picture and experience of the transatlantic traffic were from a West African perspective, there is even evidence of wealthy African families sailing all the way to America to get their children back during the 19th century. And there are copious records attesting to the practice of ransom, i.e. the practice of people capturing and selling two or more people to get back a loved one that had been sold into slavery. Can such a person be called a slave trader with any degree of certainty? Can you be sure that you would not kidnap people you did not know to get back your child if faced with such a dilemma? I certainly can't. To make the simple, bald claim that Africans were docile or that they generally sold their own people, knowing that most West Africans of the time were not involved in slave trading at all, is like saying the English killed their own people when they invaded Ireland or fought the French, because today we see them all as white and European. And of course, it's not as if the English ruling class were treating their own people wonderfully during the period in question. This colonial projection of Africa is useful to some, as it avoids having to use the usual tools to explain the behaviour of real human beings economics, market demand, dynastic rivalries, ethnic enmity, class distinctions, pure profit-seeking, self-preservation, love and more. It allows one to offer a person's Africanness, a concept that did not yet exist in the period, as an explanation for their behaviour. Africans sold their own people is the historical version of black-on-black -black violence. None of this is offered to excuse African elites then or now for their greed and caprice, nor black people generally for our human flaws, but rather to paint a full picture of a complex phenomenon as we would with any other region, time period and the peoples living in it.
Is an Irishman like Bob Gildoff in a position to assert that Africans are eternally shamed? Is the story of Ireland so uniquely pure among the history of nations that it places Gildoff in a position to cast this kind of aspersion on an entire continent? No, of course it is not. There was slavery in Celtic Ireland long before the English arrived. This justifies nothing the English did, of course. Irish merchants collaborated in selling Irish people to traders as early as the Vikings. Anglophile Irish chiefs collaborated with the English in their conquest of Ireland, and Irish merchants and landowners forcefully stole land from their own people in the midst of the worst famine in modern European history. As we've seen, the Irish in America became slave owners and ardent supporters of white supremacy, despite their own sufferings at the hands of the British. One of the staunchest Irish nationalists, John Mitchell, became a vocal supporter of black slavery, despite the fact that one of the most prominent black churches in America managed to send aid to the Irish famine, even though much of its congregation was still enslaved. I do not say any of this to suggest that the Irish are eternally shamed, nor to suggest that Irish humans are uniquely flawed or that these actions represent the morality of all Irish people. Indeed, some Irish nationalists themselves called out this hypocritical behaviour at the time. I say this simply to say that if Africans are eternally cursed for the greed and caprice of some of their number, then so is all humanity, including Geldof's Irish compatriots. It's also fascinating that Gildoff did not assert that British people, much less all white people, were eternally shamed for their role in enslaving their fellow human beings, but whatever. The average Irishman would certainly resent being conflated with an Englishman, yet Gildoff and others can gloss over centuries of diverse and complicated history with the African sold their own people cliché. Oh, and by the way, I am aware that this chapter is about Britain and the island is obviously not part of Britain, but Gildoff is such a part of the British establishment and represents so well its colonial arrogance that I doubt my Irish homies will object to me including him. Which brings us on to the wider way in which the British Empire as a whole is remembered. Back in 2005, future Prime Minister Gordon Brown let the world know that the days of Britain having to apologise for its colonial history are over, leaving us all wondering when those days of apology were. In a 2014 YouGov survey, 59% of Brits declared that they were proud of the empire. The historian, Niall Ferguson, gloated approvingly on his Twitter, I won. I'd love to see a similar survey done with only British citizens whose families come from non-white former colonies and, of course, the not-quite-whites of Ireland. Wouldn't the true measure of the British Empire's supposed benevolence surely be attained by asking the billions of humans that descend from the people it ruled if they remember it so favourably? The fact remains, no one colonises another group of people out of love for them. Anyone familiar with the traditions of post-colonial scholarship will know that African, Asian, Irish and Caribbean intellectuals and the peoples they represent do not share Niall Ferguson's fond memories of the empire, which is why he, as a historian, must ignore the most prominent intellectuals of those regions. In the British Caribbean, the post-colonial tradition was pioneered by Walter Rodney, C.L.R. James and Eric Williams, who are still pretty much standard reading for any educated Caribbean adult. In India, we could take Booker Prize winning author Arundhati Roy, perhaps the most prominent global critic of modern India's corruption and its mistreatment of its vulnerable populations, and even an outspoken voice of dissent against Gandhi worship. Anyone familiar with Roy's work will know that she, unlike some Indian Hindu fascists, has no nationalist axe to grind. Yet her assessment of Britain's empire in India and elsewhere is much like my own. We could also choose Pankaj Mishra, whose masterful book on the Asian intellectuals who challenged European hegemony to remake Asia is a brilliant refutation of Eurocentric nonsense. He also, incidentally, gave Mr Ferguson quite an intellectual spanking in the London Review of Books. If we go to Kenya, 
where Mr. Ferguson grew up in the shadows of the Gulag, we could talk to Ngugi Wafiongo, unquestionably the most well-known Kenyan novelist and scholar and a man imprisoned by Jomo Kenyatta's repressive, UK-backed, independent government. Despite his accurate and persistent criticisms of the corruption and brutality of African elites, has he resorted to forgetting that British rule was horrendous? Nope. In fact, you'd be hard-pressed to find prominent intellectuals from any of Britain's non-white former colonies or Ireland who are both respected in their native lands and who share Britain's romantic and fond memories of its empire. Why is this so? To understand why people across the world have such a different understanding of British colonialism, we must address a number of things. First, Britons were submitted to generations of deliberate, imperialist, militarist propaganda in all areas of culture, from education to the cinema, theatre and music halls, and in the production of huge imperial exhibitions at Wembley and elsewhere. The myopia this propaganda still produces was aptly captured when the Secretary of State for International Trade, Liam Fox, said in 2016 in the run-up to the EU referendum that the United Kingdom is one of the few countries in the European Union that does not need to bury its 20th century history. Funny, because Britain is, in fact, one of the few countries in the world that literally did bury a good portion of its 20th century history. During the period of decolonization, the British state embarked upon a systematic process of destroying the evidence of its crimes. Codenamed Operation Legacy, the state intelligence agencies and the Foreign Office conspired to literally burn, bury at sea or hide vast amounts of documents containing potentially sensitive details of things done in the colonies under British rule. Anything that might embarrass the government, that would show religious or racial intolerance or be used unethically by a post-independence government was ordered destroyed or hidden. The Foreign Office were forced to admit in court about having hidden documents, then were unforthcoming about the scale of what was hidden, to the point that you'd be a fool to trust anything that is now said. But from what we know, Hundreds of thousands of pages of documents were destroyed and over a million hidden, not just starting in the colonial period, but dating all the way back to 1662. This operation was only exposed to the public in 2011 as part of a court case between the survivors of British concentration camps in Kenya and the government. What this means is that it is completely impossible to write a truly accurate history of the British Empire, and anything written before Operation Legacy was revealed is certainly incomplete. It is revealing that some historians, that is, people whose profession is supposed to be guided by evidence, have not taken to reviewing their thoughts about the wonders of the British Empire even after such a revelation. The destruction of historical memory is not limited to documents. While Britain has preserved the HMS victory as a tribute to Nelson, as well as other ships from key periods of British history, not a single slave ship survives. You have to stand in awe of the intellectual obedience it takes to still cheer for empire after the revelation that the government hid or burned a good portion of the evidence of what that empire actually consisted of but such is the use to which we put our free thinking. You see, imperial apologists would like to view themselves as the apogee of Western thinking, as great contributors to the impressive history of Western intellectual inquiry, when in fact they actually represent its ossification. They represent the very decline of the West that they bemoan. Say what we might about the brutality of European colonial expansion, but we cannot deny that European thinkers from Giordano Bruno to William Tyndale, Thomas Paine to Bertrand Russell, have faced persecution and even death to push the intellectual envelope in their respective societies and times. Liberal apologists for empire are nothing but glorified cheerleaders for the current powers and status quo, who on the one hand bemoan the moralism of critics of empire, 
yet simultaneously claim that what made the British Empire superior to all others in the world's history was apparently its enlightened morals. Thus, the propaganda continues. Most people are still not at all aware of what has been done in their name, such as the deliberate starving to death of millions of people in India, the imprisonment and mass torture of British Kenyans in concentration camps in the 1950s, the removal of the population of Diego Garcia for a US army base, widespread use of torture and a swathe of secret wars that have seen the British military active for almost all of the last 100 years, including the supposed post-war period. People are also unaware of the degree to which British rule was violently resisted everywhere it trod across the globe. This resistance was so widespread that the historian Richard Gott has been able to fill an entire mammoth tome with just these episodes of rebellion and tell the story of the empire in reverse through the eyes of its resistors. It is rather odd then that if what the British Empire was offering was so self-evidently a good deal for all, the restless natives so often picked up their guns to fight against it. Even the natives were too stupid to know what was good for them, or perhaps what was being offered was not such a sweet deal after all. But the final reason we don't have a greater critical dialogue about the empire is plain old racism. Many would not care even if they knew the history well. What we do is okay. What others do is bad. It's worth quoting the historian John Newsinger at length here. What they have to be asked is how they would respond if other states had done to Britain what the British state has done to other countries. How pro-imperialist would they feel, for example, if, instead of Britain forcing opium on the Chinese empire, it had been the other way round? What would their response be if, when the British government had tried to ban the importation of opium, the Chinese had sent a powerful military expedition to ravage the British coastline, bombard British ports and slaughter British soldiers and civilians? What if, instead of seizing Hong Kong, the Chinese had seized Liverpool and used Merseyside as a bridgehead from which to dominate Britain for nearly a hundred years? What if further British resistance provoked another attack that led to the Chinese occupying London, looting and burning down Buckingham Palace and dictating humiliating peace terms? What if today there was an imperial museum in Beijing that still put on display the fruits of the Chinese pillage of Britain? None of this is fanciful because it is exactly what the British state did to China in the 19th century. The primary difference between Britain and other empires was not that we were not as bad as the Belgians or the Third Reich, which is true, but is such a shit boast, but that Britain succeeded in dominating the globe and still kind of does, albeit as a second fiddle to the USA in the Anglo-American empire. The question we should ask today is not, were we as bad as the Germans, but rather, is it possible to critically and honestly reflect on Britain's history in an attempt to build a more ethical future? Can Britain ever behave in the world like the democracy it claims to be, or is such a thing entirely impossible? Is it more important to cling on to power and prestige and outdated Victorian notions of dominance and superiority, even if such a tendency may well help to accelerate another world war and helps cause unspeakable suffering globally? 59% of Britons apparently think it is more important and their prophets cannot even begin to imagine a world without empires. And you know what? It's entirely possible that they will be proved right. One could quite reasonably argue based on world history that brutality, corruption, duplicity and aggression are actually good politics and the public just need to grow up and accept that. But that is an entirely different conversation than pretending that British imperialism was and is motivated by a higher morality. However, as much as the tendency to dominate, divide and brutalise has been a seeming constant for the past few millennia at least, so too has the tendency of sharing and cooperation, of rebellion against dominant powers and attempts to create a more just order. The degree to which humans have secured a more just world has been born out of the struggles against empires as much as anything else. While I'm sure Mr. Ferguson and others would accuse me of working myself up into a state of high moral indignation, 
about the crimes of the British Empire, I'll bet that he and others like him will be wearing their poppy every 11th of November. That is, they will be working themselves up into a state of high moral indignation about dead people when those dead people are truly British. The Kenyans tortured in the 1950s were legally British citizens, but naturally there will be no poppies or tears for them. The implications are clear. Some ancestors deserve to be remembered and venerated, and others do not. Those that kill for Britain are glorious. Those killed by Britain are unpeople. If we truly cared for peace, would we not remember the victims of British tyranny every 11th of November too? I speak about the British Empire so much, not just because I live here and have been shaped by it, not that any historical interest needs explaining, but because its legacies are so clear and visible, and because unlike the Spanish, Portuguese, German or Japanese empires, it still sort of exists, albeit in attenuated form as second fiddle to the American empire, despite what our free press likes to pretend. Our ruling class and much of the citizenry seem to believe that it is still our divine right to police the world and to hell with what the rest of the planet thinks. What is most fascinating about British intellectual discourse is that we can see brutality ever so clearly when it wears Japanese or German or Islamic clothes. But when it comes to looking in the mirror at the empire on which the sun never set, the 18th century's premier slave trader, the mother country of the Commonwealth, and one of the pioneer countries in developing and then putting into practice the Enlightenment philosophy of white supremacy, so many suddenly become blind, deaf and dumb, unable to see murder as murder.